Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting to order for the Deschutes County Board of Commissioners, 9 a.m. Join us, please, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, I don't have any blue sheets for citizen input in the room. Oh, they're over there. Oh, right here. Thank you so much. Yes, since no one's sitting there. Thank you. Service. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, Charles, would you like to go first? And please identify yourself for the record. Okay. Uh, my name is Charles Bear. I live in Redmond, Oregon, and um, uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you to the Deschutes County Commissioners for the wonderful job that you're doing, and I'd like to say thank you to the Deschutes County Commissioners for uh, giving me this time to speak. You know, I've spoken uh, in front of the Bend City Council, and I've spoken in front of the Redmond City Council on many occasions. And it's an important, it's an important part of our, our democracy, and it's an important part of our government to have public speaking in front of uh, our elected leaders. And it seems to me that the Bend City Council and the Redmond City Council has gone on permanent lockdown in terms of allowing uh, citizens to come speak in person in front of the city councils. And I'm concerned about that. And I just wanted to bring that up. And I just wanted to thank the Deschutes County uh, Commissioners for keeping this very important, uh, very important, uh, uh, transparent, public forum for, for people to come and speak, because it really is important. So thank you again. Um, also, I want to say Happy New Year to everybody. And I'm very optimistic about this year. I think this is going to be a fantastic year. Uh, I think that this is going to be um, a great year for Deschutes County and for Deschutes County politics. I think I think people are getting very motivated uh, and politically aware, and I think people are getting very excited about uh, a whole bunch of new candidates coming into the mix, and uh, I think it's going to be, we're going to get a lot of good work done. Um, I... Uh, so I'm very, very happy about this year. I look back on last year, and there was a bunch of stuff going on, and I didn't, um, I didn't, uh, I wasn't made aware of a lot of opinions um, from our leaders, our political leaders in Deschutes County on a few important topics. Um, there was a lot of silence on a few important issues. Uh, one of the issues was, uh, a year ago today, uh, when the Republican Party tried to overthrow the government. Um, for the record, I'm against overthrowing the government, but I'd like to hear more uh, from, from the leaders of Deschutes County on where they stand on overthrowing the government. And uh, also, um, a, a man was murdered here in Bend last year on the street. And nobody's really talking about that. I'd like to hear more about that. And I'd like to hear more about um, other things like that. My three minutes has probably come and gone. Uh, thank you very much. And have a great year. Thank you for being aware. Um, I don't know if someone is available to do a time. So the clock? I was able to start. Did you start it? Okay. I was looking at my clock, and I'm going like, okay, it's not on the screen. So I can uh, start three minutes again. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Rondo, yeah, would if you if like I could, to? If I could also just say I, uh, thank you for... Um, uh, thank you for thanking us for keeping meetings op open uh, at this time while uh, the Omicron variant of COVID is raging through our community. It is really important uh, for people to wear masks uh, <laughs> uh, during these public meetings so that we can continue to have them in person. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you for wearing your mask and thank you for making sure it's up above your nose. I'm going to assume that we can speak, so we can speak clearly. And uh, we'll I talk through my mask, so I, 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 would, I would appreciate it if you would talk through yours. I can't always understand people who are speaking through their masks. 
I would like um, to also add my voice to the thanking of our county commissioners and to uh, point out that it takes a level of bravery to do something that um, others uh, it, at your peer level aren't doing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I am speaking to you, but I'm also speaking to the larger you. If you're representing us in this democratic republic of ours and you're not allowing us to make contact with you in a room or in a space, then I don't think you're doing your job. And so what I'm saying is that you three are doing your job more than you three, if I may say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it is a team sport, democracy is. And um, uh, I am tired of no longer having uh, expectations in my life on a personal or a political level. And um, 2022 is going to be different because we are going to have those expectations. And um, you can't have expectations without demands. And uh, so we're going to see some things this year that we haven't seen before because um, people of courage are going to follow you or they're going to lead you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Rondo. Okay. Um, are there any calls on uh, Stephanie that you can see on Zoom this morning? Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, I think that's one of the um, good things that we as county commissioners has done is we've really, truly, this whole pandemic tried to maintain our relationship with the community. And um, I, I think it really helps our meetings by being in person. Uh, it's you know, thank goodness we have the room to be spaced here, but truly it is, um, you know, it is government and it is your government. So thank you for reminding us of how important it is. And, you know, I would hope other people would see that and perhaps uh, realize that it is important. And I'll just take a moment and acknowledge, uh, you know, there were, we used to have six of us up here at the front. So the county administrator, deputy county minister, legal counsel, and commissioners, we were all just side by side right up here. So we have a little bit of elbow room to be able to have these public meetings. Uh, so it is a different time. Uh, but I do advocate for meetings in public. I've been asking for meetings. We had a joint meeting with the city of Bend, and we did meet in this room. Uh, I think uh, pretty much everybody was here. I don't know if there was one or two that were remote. but. Uh, yeah, I do advocate for that. And, you know, let's do it appropriately. Whatever we need to do, space it out, six-foot tables, big room, uh, I do advocate for that. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a motion on the consent agenda? I move approval of the consent agenda. And I will second it. Any other discussion? Commissioner Chang? Yes. Commissioner DeBone? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Um, our first action item today, we. Um, have promised that the COVID update would be at 9.30. So we can go ahead. There is a request for a new code enforcement specialist. Peter? Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission. For the record, Peter Gutowski, Community Development Director, and I'm joined here with uh, Sherry Pinner, our Senior Management Analyst. And I'll turn it over to, uh, to Sherry to provide you an overview in terms of kind of the budgeting and our, and our, and our finances in terms of this respectful request for a, uh, another uh, code compliance officer and certainly uh, we're here to answer any other questions you may have about the program um, as certainly as summarized in the memorandum good morning um, you may recall during CDD's year 22 budget presentation we mentioned that we may be back before you to expand our code enforcement or code compliance team and that's where we're at today. So kind of in short, uh, cases are coming in at a higher rate than we can actually close them out. We have a staff of four, a team of four, and two of those are recently vacated and um, have gone through the recruitment process. So we have two new staff beginning probably in February. Um, each of the four uh, current or previous staff had a caseload of anywhere between say 120 and 200 cases, which is uh, significantly high. Um, we've done some analysis on, uh, we do believe that a fifth code compliance staff would uh, certainly help this team manage the volume that we've experienced. And then um, also it would really pair well with the training if the third person could, could start with the two positions that are open and then we could train them all at the same time. 
And there's a, certainly a lot of conversation that we could have, but I didn't uh, want to continue to discuss what's in the memo, um, and I thought maybe we could uh, see what questions you have. I do believe current revenues and future revenues will cover the cost. Um, and certainly this particular fiscal year where we've had, uh, like many departments across the county, we've had a significant amount of unfilled positions and so we've had cost savings, if you will. Um, and so I don't see that as being a problem. So um, Sherry, today, do you have the number through the entire 2021? Because it's through September on our information. I am just beginning to look at December and year end stats, so I do not have anything, um, anything more frequent or recent than November. September is what it says on here. It says January through September 2021. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. I updated the number. The 801 is through the end of November, and I failed to update the. It is through November. Yeah. Okay. All right. My apologies. No, 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 no. I just, I was hoping that we could you know have the number okay so perhaps it was the same as last year then the they're, number they're very close as you can see with the annual code compliance cases we really had a significant increase beginning in 2018 and those cases have really plateaued at a, a fairly high number um, and we anticipate you know there was 880 in 2020 uh, yes 2020 through November of 2021 it was 801 and I suspect we easily received 100 in December because that's kind of standard Right. And it's a lot of cases per person, too, isn't Correct. it? Correct. Correct. Can, can I ask about, uh, I, I mean, the, this is a, just a, his, a bit of a historical context, but what happened between 2016 and 2018? I mean, we, we went, we practically doubled the number of uh, code compliance cases from 494 in 2016 to you know, 935 in 2018. What, what what was going on in Deschutes County that suddenly there was, you know, a, a, almost a doubling of of code code compliance cases? You know, the there's there's probably many answers to that question, many factors. But the one that comes to the top of my mind is we had sort of a shift in how we received cases. Um, we we had a point in time where we uh, the sheriff's office began submitting cases that they see when they're out and about in the community. Okay. That certainly increased the number of cases. Um, you know, we certainly have, if, if something comes to our attention that's not reported, reported by a citizen, then, you know, and if it's a fire life and safety issue, we report that ourselves to code enforcement. Um, and so so I, I believe that that is one of the larger factors, but there probably are many. Commissioner Tang, I was going to uh, also respond. I, I, the, just some other factors for consideration. The, the significant investment that we're seeing in Deschutes County at a macro level, um, uh, as our as our community becomes, do I dare say, more uh, more of a metropolitan uh, experience? You know, in terms of the built environment, there's just people have higher expectations about how the county should look and function than it did you know when we were more rural when our population was less than 200,000 people the other experience that we've so that's the macro perspective more people are investing in the rural county and uh, have have expectations but the other the other factor that we've seen over time there was a point where if someone was in code compliance and let's say they had unpermitted structures and uh, they applied, they needed to apply for building permits to get those into code. There was a point where we in good faith said, okay, you're, you've got the building permits, you're, you, you know, we're going to sign off on uh, you completing uh, your, your voluntary compliance agreement, you've got the permits, and we're going to presume that those are going to get implemented. And what we found in, in several instances, and it's not in the hundreds, of course, but there's been instances where people have not followed through on those building permits. And so we're learning and adapting to experiences where we are, in the past, we've given people the benefit of the doubt. They've demonstrated good faith. We have all these other files that take priority, only to come to realize that um, it's taking more time to work cooperatively with people who are in code compliance to get them actually into the end zone, get, get them past the goal line, right? And so that's another set of factors, but there's, mul there's, there's many others that, 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 that lead to this spike. Um, 
but certainly the cases are becoming much more complex just to just to resolve and and that in itself is adding to um, our efficiencies and the program is not adapted to be you know uh, quick and easy because of uh, the, the individuality or the individual circumstances associated with other cases with each case and and again trying to get them to voluntary compliance I can see we're kind of still halfway between the enforcement and compliance terminology the there's both of them on the memo here but uh, it really is an effort and an outreach to uh, you know bring bring people up to up to kind of community expectations uh, the culture of uh, fire life and safety plus uh, you know I, we get the calls or I've gotten the call a few times from a real, real estate agent saying hey man I got this great property for sale but that person across the street sure has their you know treasures or whatever the situation is so then there's just kind of uh, promotes that 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 community discussion about well, what can we do about it uh, uh, we've got a great culture at the county of just making the presence let's get some voluntary compliance let's just get some vision on what we're what we're seeing here uh, as I say there's all kinds of cases out there also long history of it in Deschutes County and it is a function of uh, uh, you know property values and population density uh, and we've we've seen that over the years. Uh, it used to be, oh yeah, there's people out there, but they're just taking care of themselves, and nobody. But and then all of a sudden, properties sell on both sides. So we're like, well, how can we help this neighborhood kind of raise the, you know, uh, I don't know if it's the, you know, the, the culture of it or whatever. You know, just different views of what what's going on out there. So. Uh, yeah, I do support adding this position, making a strong, positive uh, reference to, uh, you know, the people that are buying the properties, but also just, uh, you know, just health and safety, groundwater protection, just the basics also. I also support um, adding this position, but I, I, I still have some questions about how we align the work that to be done with how we pay for it. Um, and. Uh, you know, I, I uh, just kind of based on these categories, I'm guessing there are things, there are things in this caseload where someone just got a permit, you know, in the last year or two, and now you're having to check on, uh, on, that, on that person and making sure that they're complying with the, the, the terms of those, the, that permit. But there's also stuff like, you know, solid waste, noxious weeds. People don't get a permit to have noxious weeds. So if we're using revenue from other, other people who are um, you know, getting permits to, 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 to do various kinds of developments or land uses, and then we're using that revenue to enforce noxious weeds, it, it doesn't seem quite right to me. Um, it, it really seems like uh, there's part of the, the code compliance load that is about uh, maintaining quality of life for long-term residents, you know, because I'm guessing that long-term residents are often the people who are complaining, you know, filing complaints about uh, um, code violations. And if we are trying to maintain quality of life for long-term residents, I actually think that it may be more appropriate to pay for that out of property tax revenues than, than, than fee revenue. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's just a, you know, that's just my opinion. So I, I would love to get a, a sense from you all of kind of the breakdown of, you know, how much of this code compliance activity is tied to something that someone recently paid a fee for and how much is, um, you know, really, uh, you know, main, you're protecting the quality of life of, of people in the community who are long-term residents and property taxpayers. Very good discussion and great question. So code compliance has two lines of revenue. One is an, a noxious weed grant. So we receive, I believe it's 14,000, it could be 12, but it's right in that range to manage and implement the noxious weed program, which is new to us this year. And then we have a 0.25% charge against building valuation. So against every building permit that comes in, so that's a structural single family dwelling permit, commercial, uh, and also the remodels is charged against the building valuations. And, and that, is, that is simply the, the, the two revenue lines that we have. Okay. I, I am so, unclear on, has it, has it it's, it's likely been uh, 
calculated and charged that way for many, many decades, I'm assuming. Um, certainly as long as I've been with the county. The way I see it is as we're going up and the activity is growing, this, uh, you know, we do have the capacity for this position. Uh, if there's a point in the future when, uh, you know, the, the building uh, permit revenue does either taper off or, or go flat, there will be a, a discussion about general fund at some point. We've done that with long-term long -term planning during a recession when, uh, you know, permitting stops, but we really want to have a vision uh, of, of kind of a long-term plan about what development options are out in the future. So there's a kind of an up and down cycle to this. And we're in the generally the up cycle because of the right. investment that's happening. Um, so, yeah, at some point there may be a discussion about, you know, yeah. funding or backfilling or... I appreciate that, but it, it seems like right. I mean, you know, based on the amount of complaints that we get, it, it sure seems like the uh, the need for code compliance capacity is is huge, um, and and there are expectations in our community about about you know how timely the county is going to be and and uh, you know whether things are going to get fixed or not, and if if uh, permit revenue is is constraining us from adding capacity, it's kind of like we have to check the permit revenue first before we can think about adding this capacity that we just need. Um, then I, I I don't think we want to wait until you know I don't think we want to just kind of keep this coupled to permit revenue and then when permit revenue tapers off, think about general fund investment. But I, I think. It would make sense to think about general fund investment on the front end, basically again for uh, maintaining the quality of life of long-term residents and property taxpayers. Um, that's, it, you know, it, I mean, am I am I right that <coughs> a lot of the the code compliance cases are initiated by neighbors who, you know, they didn't they didn't. Um, <coughs> You know, they didn't, they didn't uh, get a permit for X, Y, or Z in, in, in recent times. They're just, you know, d you know, frustrated or disappointed or upset about what's happening in their neighborhood. I believe you are correct. Um, and again, the revenue generated for code compliance is a factor of new development building permits, regardless to the reason that permit was purchased. So, for example, if someone's in code compliance and they need to purchase a building structure to satisfy meeting their requirements to be out of code compliance, that permit would just so happen to have a code compliance fee associated with it. But many of the, the permits that I, I believe code compliance cases need to get, so perhaps it's an electrical permit or a mechanical permit, those don't have any factor of a code compliance fee. It's all the new development within the rural Deschutes County that generates the revenue for our code compliance program. And I would add, if I can, Madam Chair and the Commission, it, uh, in terms of context, in terms of uh, the, the volume, uh, most of our complaints are coming from the Sheriff's Office as they're in the community and they see, they see something that has an eminent public health and safety issue. Our building inspectors are out in the field and, and if they see as part of an inspection that there's a, someone inhabiting a structure that doesn't have permits, they're, they're going to, they're, they're obligated. Of course, that's a significant issue of, 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 of a building that, that's been built without proper permitting. Um, our on-site wastewater team, our environmental soils team, when they go out and are, you know, uh, in the community, they will often see uh, irreg irregularities in relationship to uh, RV uh, hookup or just uh, inappropriate uh, septic uh, disposal. So those those all play a role. It's 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 our colleagues. I mean, it's not to say that we don't we don't get neighbor complaints. We certainly do. But it's our colleagues that are out in the community fulfilling their their kind of their various responsibilities that. Um, that, that trigger, uh, I think when you, when you combine all of them, those are generating most of the complaints. And, and many of the, and, and many, I would say, you know, so as, as Sherry noted, uh, you know, that we have approximately 800 active files. You know, there's, 
we're going through the data now just because there's a fresh opportunity to look at the structure of code compliance with some of the recent resignations that we've had. But there are many properties that have multiple violations, multiple infractions. And so um, 800 is a lot. I'm not trying to diminish that number, but there's a, a significant subset that have five or six violations relating to all the categories I just highlighted. And so one code compliance specialist is working with a property owner, you know, to handle a multitude of issues. And, and, and when there are those the, the, the significant elements to a property, it, it takes, a, it takes a, uh, a lot of time to just coordinate sometimes with our, uh, with our legal counsel as well to, to, to get those uh, property owners into compliance. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I just so appreciate Angie, the job that she does. She is so good, and I'm hoping she's not one of those people that gave notice. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that the team is down, and I do. I'm, I support adding this position also. I, um, we've got to do a better job. I know I, I drove out in July of 2020 to a home site that was being the neighbors were furious over, and I drove out there in July of 21, and. I wasn't particularly impressed with the amount of progress we'd made, honestly, but I know it's being worked on. So sometimes I realize it takes longer than what we as, or as the residents on that street really are hoping that we can do. And I think we really desperately need to add another person. And especially since we're down two, um, it, it, makes, um, it makes perfect sense. Is there a motion? I mean, I'd also just like to say uh, thank you for sharing kind of that, how the intake process works. It's, it's helpful to understand that. But when, I mean, we do get a lot of, uh, we do get a lot of citizen complaints. And I, I, I would like to be able to say to those people, um, I, I, you know, I don't, <laughs> what I don't want to say to those people is, uh, yeah, we, we can't get to that in a timely fashion because we, the, the number of cases that each staff person has is unsustainable. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I fully support adding this position. Um, I, I also, I'm, I'm curious whether um, the, the, the vacancies, the two, the two vacancies, whether that's a, a, a red flag, that, that's something we should be concerned about, or it's just kind of the, the natural cycle of things and, and you don't have a lot of worry about being able to refill those positions. So both of those positions have been recruited for and offered. So, and we actually did get a really good candidate pool and, the, the, and we actually do have a third person that we'd like to make an offer to provided that this position is granted. Right. Um, I'd like to further add that with the departure of 50% you know, of our team, it's giving us a really uh, fantastic opportunity to sort of sit down, look at how we do business, ways that we can improve efficiencies, can we do it differently than we have in the past, which is always a, a question I keep on the forefront of my mind as we look at operations. And um, I can also kind of queue up uh, for the next budget cycle. We're going to be looking at ways to improve our software system, Excella, so that code compliance and probably planning uh, files are better able to be managed or more efficiently managed. I don't know what that means right now. We're, we've, you know, we're just really, we've really started these conversations yesterday. Um, so, so we really are kind of taking a look at, at, the, at the whole program from the ground level up and how do we want to do things, where can we be different and more efficient. If I could just offer, um, in addition to what, what Sherry just said, is it a red flag? I think uh, one person moved out of state for a position, um, so left the region. Uh, another person had been retired from another position who was working on our staff and decided to, to retire again. So. To me, those are, those are not the red flags, but given the volume and complexity and contentiousness of the work, I think in order to successfully recruit and then retra retain new staff, I think the fifth uh, code compliance specialist is really critical so that it's a manageable workload because they have been really stressed and really taxed. The best thing that can happen right now until we hire new people is to keep this snow on the ground because that keeps often the cases down uh, during winter for a uh, at least a couple of months. It, it can be, um, well, it can be a quieter period in, in code compliance before it begins to increase in spring, which is just the seasonal trends 
with the program? Um, recruiting and getting the team together and in this uh, you know, pre-spring time is probably the key to the whole operation. So with that, I'll move approval of the addition of one new code enforcement specialist position. Second. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I, I would like to, us to continue to think about how we pay for this work because, uh, again, if, if, if this work is really about maintaining quality of life for um, long-term residents who are taxpayers and not about responding to things that have gone wrong with permits, then uh, tying this so closely, heavily to permit, permit fee revenue I don't think is the, the appropriate way to structure it. Okay, um, Commissioner Debon? Yes. Commissioner Chang? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Thank, Thank you. you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Kyle, we promised the health department that they could be at 9.30, and it's 9.31. They're on a limited time factor with Dr. Johnson. Would you mind coming back? Is your morning um, flexible? I know it's a very sh brief um, process that you need to do this morning. Um, sure, that's that's totally fine with me. If if uh, there's some other priority that needs to happen. Okay. Well, they just they just reiterated yesterday that they really need to be at 9:30. So, um, I'm hoping we could do that, and then we'll get back to you. So, is the health department on, Stephanie? Thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle, for your um, your patience. Good morning, Commissioners. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Nahad. Happy New Year. Thank you. And, and my, um, my apologies to Kyle as well for um, uh, having to wait a bit longer. Um, I'm sure he has important things to do as well, so um, I understand. But we do appreciate uh, that you let us um, go at 9.30, given especially that we have colleagues outside of the county who are joining in this call. For the record, uh, my name is Nahad Sadrazudi. I'm the Director of Public Health for Deschutes County Health Services. Um, and I'm joined by several colleagues here. Um, there, maybe I'll introduce them, and if it's okay, I have Dr. Rita Bacho. She is the Manager for Advancement and Protections Section within the Health Department. I, we have Emily Freeland, who is our Supervisor for COVID Response and Resilience. I don't see Crystal here yet. Uh, but when Crystal does join us, Crystal Solly, she is our vaccine operations and delivery uh, supervisor. And we have um, Dr. Michael uh, Johnson. She, he is a senior data scientist at the St. Charles Health System. Um, Mike, I hope you don't mind that I introduced you. Okay. So um, I, before we get started, oh, and I see Crystal here as well. I already introduced you, Crystal. Um, let me start by sharing my screen. I am going to assume that um, the technology on your side is sorted out and we are streaming already. I don't know if that's still happening or not and if there is uh, also translation already um, set up. Yes, we're good. Awesome. Great, 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 great. Okay, uh, before we get started, I would also like to um, sincerely acknowledge a great colleague, um, Jesse Terpstra, who is one of those people who does a lot of work behind the scenes and rarely gets um, the public uh, recognition and acknowledgement. Uh, she um, once we, uh, our epidemiologist, Jenny Faith, um, separated and joined um, another institute. Uh, Jesse stepped up and um, supported us with regards to COVID uh, data management. And, um, and she's going to have a more prominent role um, in the COVID data management in the coming uh, year. Uh, she spent a lot of time putting um, the data and the slides together, and I just wanted to um, acknowledge her. Yeah. So we hope that we have put together a succinct uh, presentation focusing on the main points uh, we will be covering some of the new developments uh, which inform our decision making uh, in, the, in the county. Um, and uh, we have some epi data, some operational information around vaccination and testing, followed by a medical system update, uh, which will be given by um, uh, Mike. 
So I don't know if um, everyone is aware there's a new variant <laughs> on, the, on the loose, uh, Omicron. Um, I think we had some discussions uh, about this actually a few weeks ago. Uh, for the public, uh, it's important to know that this is a variant of uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that does cause uh, COVID-19. Now, this particular variant has unusually large number of mutations and a significant number of which uh, affect the spike protein, uh, which is generally targeted by the COVID-19 vaccines. So just a couple of uh, columns here on what we are still learning about this variant and what um, we think we can still do about it. Um, certainly, the incubation period, um, and this is uh, the time where one is exposed to an infectious agent up to when we show symptoms. So that period of time seems to be shortening quite a bit uh, with, with uh, relation to this uh, variant. So the alpha versus the delta versus this particular variant, uh, we are seeing a, a progressively shorter incubation period of roughly two to four day range, let's say median of three days. Um, and that's important because that affects how quickly we're able to identify infection and prevent um, uh, the infectious agent from transmitting the virus. So this can really truly affect our business model of containing. Uh, transmission and this virus. We're also still learning about the transmissibility of this virus, and, and that basically speaks to how efficiently this virus is able to link to the re cell receptors um, and enter and be able to manufacture itself and then get spread. Um, this particular <clears throat> virus from or this variant of uh, virus from what we're learning from CDC and other publications is that it does appear to be more efficient and contagious. Uh, one particular study shows that it spreads um, around 70 times faster than the previous um, variants. Interestingly so, it seems to be more of an upper respiratory, um, uh, located in the upper respiratory rather than lower respiratory. Uh, and that could be correlated with some of the so-called mild symptoms that we are uh, observing, though, frankly, we're not sure if that's a reflection of the characteristic of the virus or the general immunity that we have in the population. Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, severity of illness or disease severity, uh, severity again, um, we, quote unquote, we are hearing that um, uh, those who have acquired the virus and experienced this uh, variant uh, seem to show mild um, illness. Um, and uh, uh, at the individual level, that might be true, though we're still learning about it. But when we look at it from a population level and the impact of that, especially in our medical system, I don't think uh, we can uh, truly discount the severity of this uh, illness or this disease. So that's something that we're still uh, learning about um, and trying to understand better. Efficacy of existing treatments, I think uh, what uh, we are seeing is that, uh, especially yesterday, um, there was uh, information coming out of CDC and OHA that um, there's still uh, one monoclonal therapy that uh, seems to be effective. Um, as we are all aware, uh, monoclonal therapies uh, are focusing on the S uh, the spike protein um, of the virus. So when there is significant change to the spike protein uh, of the virus, certainly it's going to affect um, the effectiveness of uh, the therapies that we have. Now, un antiviral therapies are a bit different because they seem to, uh, they generally focus on the me uh, mechanics of the cell. So they go inside the cell and, and sort of work on the protease uh, uh, which uh, is different than uh, the arrangement we have with the monoclonal therapies. Uh, we do have some effective um, therapies still in place, uh, which are responding to this uh, variant, but uh, that we should also keep in mind that we're still collecting information on this. And last but not least, as expected, uh, the, uh, we're, we're seeing uh, breakthroughs um, of those who are even triple vaccinated, and that's understandable because uh, uh, the vaccines, especially the mRNA vaccines, were uh, designed to uh, focus on the uh, mRNA of the spike protein, uh, 
uh, with this current uh, variant, it's uh, it's not going to be as uh, well aligned well, with the vaccines that we have. And so certainly it's going to escape our immunity and get into our cells and get us infected. Uh, however, what we are seeing is, uh, uh, is that even though we're seeing so-called vaccine breakthroughs, um, A, booster doses seem to help the effectiveness of our um, vaccinated population, and B, e, uh, there is still a layer of uh, the unsung hero of our immune system, which is the cellular immunity, which uh, is not necessarily captured by the breakthrough definition. And that's the part that really helps with reducing severity of uh, illness and potential hospital admissions. So that piece uh, is certainly still in play, and we're trying to learn more about it. So this is sort of where we are in terms of this variant. Now, what can we do about it still, given the information that I just uh, shared with you? Um, I think uh, contrary to maybe to previous messaging that I have done, um, um, and coming from a, from a public health lens, certainly I have a population health perspective. Nevertheless, I think we're at a point in this pandemic where I would be encouraging all of us individually to do our own personal risk assessment. Um, I do that right now. I have two elderly parents living with me right now. Uh, I am careful about going into indoor setting, even if I'm triple vaccinated, where people may not be masked. That is an assessment that I'm making um, on, on my own and making decisions accordingly. Uh, some people may have underlying conditions. So they might be going through cancer treatment. They might be immunocompromised. They might be living with people who are immunocompromised. People should make their own um, assessments based on the risks that they're facing. Um, so that is the starting point for me. And that's uh, the extent of my individual um, um, sort of health-related advice. Uh, beyond that, uh, in terms of the population level, certainly um, getting vaccinated is better than none. And getting boosted is even better than uh, receiving the primary doses. So that tool is still working despite um, this uh, variant changing uh, characteristic in its spike protein because we are still hopeful about the cellular immunity, if nothing else. Uh, certainly wearing mask, uh, surgical medical mask, can, can 95 and 95 depending on personal risk, the situation we're in is still helpful. I do it, especially during winter where it's cold, it helps with my nose, if nothing else, keeping it warm. Uh, so that's, uh, that is certainly um, a tool that we have. Physical distancing um, is still uh, clearly working. And hygiene. Um, and those are, frank frankly, transferable skills <laughs> for even other respiratory diseases, not just COVID. Getting tested. The data that we have around testing shows that um, uh, the antigen tests are still holding uh, their own against this virus. Ultimately, the PCR or antigen, it really comes down to the amount of virus that we have at the moment of testing. PCRs do better with less uh, uh, virus in our bodies uh, for longer periods of time. Uh, antigens are quicker, and they are really helpful in identifying a period where we are infectious. Um, a, a positive or a negative uh, test should be taken with grain of salt because there are some um, reliability issues, especially with this variant. Uh, there is some reduced sensitivity that uh, we are observing. And then seeking treatment. As I mentioned earlier, uh, um, uh, at least one of the monoclonal antibody therapies um, and the antiviral um, uh, therapies that we have, treatments that we have, are effective. So um, if you're eligible uh, or if you start showing symptoms or if you test positive, reach out to your primary care provider and uh, discuss with them um, uh, treatments that might be helpful uh, in, uh, in uh, helping uh, you overcome this. Uh, very quickly, I realize I'm taking a bit of uh, time uh, with these new developments, but we did have uh, a bit of time off during the holidays, so I'm sure the public is interested to know the latest uh, information. We learned yesterday, uh, or not yesterday, sorry, one second, please. Making sure I have my information in order. Okay, so what we have here in terms of uh, some uh, new information coming out of FDA, CDC, and ACIP, which is the advisory body to CDC today, 
we're expecting it. Uh, booster doses uh, for Pfizer vaccine um, are um, expected to be announced. That's uh, from basically anyone over 12 years old. For Pfizer specifically, the interval between um, the dose and the booster, the second dose and the booster, uh, is going to be shortened to five months. For Moderna and J&J, &J, it will remain the same. Um, uh, also, there was an announcement around uh, being a compromised uh, children from 5 to 11, where they can be eligible for additional dose after 28 days. So we do have some new developments in terms of uh, booster doses. And it makes sense, especially given what we're seeing from Omicron, right? Because uh, what we see is that a two-dose uh, series is only affected around 35%, whereas uh, those individuals who are boosted uh, are protected up to about 70%. Um, so that means we're going to have breakthroughs with the antibody aspect of it. Uh, with the cellular aspect of it, it might be different, uh, which uh, is something, again, we're learning. And last but not least, before I hand over to um, uh, Emily for some of the epi data, uh, consistent with what we're learning with Omicron, CDC is also looking at the science, looking at what's becoming, what is really realistic and practical, and revising its isolation and quarantine guidance. Um, and the, the details are provided here, which I'm not going to necessarily go through, no, uh, go through now. But bottom line, the two takeaways here is that there is going to be a shortened time period for isolation and quarantine with some caveats that we can certainly get into. And um, it's it's the first time probably um, officially uh, CDC is recognizing that uh, its definition of fully vaccinated will probably have to include um, booster doses. So not necessarily a booster dose, which we have, we have going on right now, but frankly, in three months or six months, the fourth the booster, the fifth, the sixth. So booster doses will probably be part of um, our set of toolkits that uh, we have to take into account for people to be considered um, um, as protected as possible. So if there are no questions on these new updates, um, I will hand the floor to Emily for the edge. Thank you, Nahad, and thank you, commissioners, for having us this morning. Um, as Nahad mentioned, and I think most of us are probably aware, our case counts are increasing and pretty significantly. Um, this is a similar pattern that we've seen across the United States and, frankly, the world with the surge surrounding probably Omicron paired with, you know, continuing Delta cases um, and our behaviors that change during the holidays, which is something that we've typically seen even in previous surges. Um, so last week we had our highest record case count at 1,365 cases. Um, and I think we will continue to see that increase. Our case numbers yesterday and the day before have been even higher than the week previous. So next week we'll probably see an even, even higher um, uh, number of cases. Um, you can see the number of breakthrough cases here is indicated on the same graph and dropped slightly last week to about 35%. So um, again, high numbers and high breakthrough or, you know, we see breakthrough cases, which is what we would typically expect um, with both Omicron and um, the fact that a large portion of our population is vaccinated. So we would see more percentage that are breakthrough. Next slide, please. Um, so we also see that our test positivity is increasing. Um, again, we had sort of a lull in the last the beginning of December. If you can call it a lull of um, about 6% was our lowest positivity rate. And then we're back up around um, 19, 20% positivity rate with um, a high volume of, of tests being administered in our community. So um, probably some of you have seen and heard, you know, that St. Charles is running kind of a record number of tests. There's a lot of people in our community who are symptomatic and seeking out testing, which is what we're asking them to do. Um, kind of the unseen piece of this story that I would like to mention is the increase of at-home test kits that are being um, purchased in the community and people are taking at home. You know, you can get these antigen type tests that Nahad mentioned which are not perfect by any means. None of our, our tools are perfect tools, but they are tools to help us both assess risk, make um, informed decisions. And a lot of people are taking these at-home tests, which you can purchase online or at the pharmacy. 
Um, there's even mail-in type of um, tests that are PCR tests. So um, this is the number of tests that we see reported through a laboratory, but there's also this whole bulk of tests that are not. Um, so those are the main um, epi kind of updates that we wanted to go over today, just our, our case rates and our test positivity rates. Um, and on to some testing and vaccination information. Emily, um, um, could I ask a question, Emily? Uh, so if, if people are taking at-home antigen tests, um, we are not capturing that data either in our in our um, uh, you know, our, our positive and negative tests test positivity rate or in our case numbers correct okay thank you except in very small circumstances so we do have some people that call the hotline and would like to report um, and then we can make presumptive cases off of that, which does capture those. But I would say it's a fraction of the number of cases that are probably being identified at home through that mechanism. Um, the other place where it would be captured is if, like, if I was a case, I went and got tested, and then my family, they took at-home tests. Um, we may create presumptive cases from that because we have that link to that particular family or, you know, cohort of people who were positive um, through that mechanism. But there's no direct so, link to our data sets. So yeah, uh, what we like know that. could be a gross underestimation of how much COVID there is in our community. Correct. I would say for a variety of reasons, whether it's um, at-home tests or people choosing not to get tested or um, you know many reasons why this number is not probably a true reflection, but it's the best reflection that we have um, but like Nahad mentioned, I think looking at our hospitalization numbers is really kind of the place that we need to be thinking about as far as metrics um, and public health, you know, where we are as a community, more looking at that hospitalization numbers, um, just because of the continual changes in how things are reported and how people are accessing testing and the choices they're making. I would say that I think our community is probably seeking out testing through a laboratory um, at a pretty high rate. I mean, I don't have the numbers to support that, but I, I think that we have a community that's trying to make wise decisions and make informed decisions. Um, and we can see that reflected in our case data and the number of tests that are being administered and just the, the demand for testing, whether it's seen at you know those curative sites or our urgent cares or the drive-through at St. Charles, many, many people are continuing to seek out testing which I don't think is like replicated um, necessarily equally throughout the state or even the nation. Okay, thank you. So speaking of testing, you know, we do have these no cost rapid PCR testing um, through Curative that we've partnered with OHA and um, COCC to have these sites. There's two in Bend, one is one is at COCC in Bend, um, one is at COCC in Redmond, and then there is one at the Les Schwab Amphitheater. The Les Schwab Amphitheater one is not a rapid PCR, it's a different one. And I would also just mention that I know this week with the weather and some staffing issues, there's been some delays um, in opening just because of, you know, can't get the parking lot open or can't get our staff to those locations because they've been stuck at home. So, um, we we understand that and people are working as hard as they can to continue to make this an available resource in our community. Um, Emily, Next. is there, uh, uh, so I, uh, my impression is that there's actually supply constraints on, uh, you know, test equipment, test kits uh, nationally. And um, I, I'm, I'm definitely hearing from people in, in the community that, uh, they are shaking every tree. They're going to, you know, they're calling various clinics. They they try to get uh, an appointment on with with curative, and and you know there was nothing available for like a week, and and um, uh, you know that that there there are generally challenges with test access availability and uh, accessibility, and I, I'm I'm wondering if there's. Uh, you know, if there are these supply constraints nationally, if there's only a finite number of labs, you know, is there anything that we can be doing at the local level to improve the availability and accessibility of testing? 
Yes, I think that, um, I mean, this week, I think that the problems were exacerbated by the weather, certainly. So just like we've had to cancel a couple of our vaccination clinics and there were road closures that are I'm hearing this morning are potentially affecting the availability of vaccine at the drive through clinic, which we're waiting to hear a little bit more on that. Um, so I think certainly all of these issues have been exacerbated by, I would say, unheard of increased demand um, for testing, as we can see in our numbers, as well as the weather and having to shut things down because of staffing issues. Um, I know that, you know, St. Charles has two of the machines that they run this on. So I think from my understanding, it's more of a staffing problem and then getting things here and there. Um, of course, we would like to see more availability of any type of test. I think we're at the point where we would encourage people to take an at-home test. And I know that the state is working on, they purchased 6 million test kits. Um, so that's 12 million kit tests that will be start to be distributed as soon as possible. Um, those are the antigen at home tests and we should be seeing some of those in Deschutes County. Um, you know, I think paired with the messaging to stay home while you're sick, if you can't ex access testing and kind of assume that there's a good chance it is COVID at this point um, and that those those isolation standards have been relaxed somewhat based on our better understanding of when someone is most contagious um, that make it more a little more reasonable for people to stay home just while they're experiencing symptoms in that first five days um, rather than the longer isolation periods of, of 10 days. So I think that those things potentially can help us move forward. Um, and, you know, we're certainly working on thinking of shifting staff around in different ways to help both beef up our vaccination efforts as well as testing efforts and, you know, supporting our community partners wherever we can um, in those ways. So, you know, we're, it's in process at this moment, working on thinking of how we can kind of shift things around to increase accessibility of testing whether that be through, you know, programs of at-home testing or helping staffing issues with our community partners or, you know, through our own mechanisms. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think uh, you uh, alluded to this and that's important. I think Commissioner um, Chang, your, your question within the broader system is something that uh, we need to, as an, you as an authority and us as your sort of executive arm or technical arm uh, need to take into account. So currently, we're in a situation where, uh, especially with Omicron, <laughs> the, uh, the containment is not feasible anymore. So uh, probably, uh, most likely, we all need to shift our public health goals of preventing transmission to reducing severity in hospital admissions. And there are different strategies and tools for that. Um, we probably should be looking at um, a more passive containment effort rather than the active one that we've tried to have. And we're certainly not reaching everyone, even with the active arrangement that we have. Two, uh, shifting resources, funding, staffing, uh, time, energy, everything towards basically testing and vaccinating. Uh, because those are the main tools that we have, and probably public education. Uh, those are the tools that we have in uh, reducing um, you know, uh, the progression of this disease because tra preventing transmission is not feasible. Um, so that's, that's really one thing to consider. The other thing is, um, are there access and supply issues that we could, as a health department, have a role in addressing? There are always ways. Um, you know, I want to acknowledge there are always ways that we can look at things differently and try to improve things, and we try to do that. There are also demand issues here. You know, it's not that we're in an environment where uh, demand is um, at a steady rate throughout the year, where we know basically this is going to be the predictable demand and this is going to be the predictable supply and is it at equilibrium or not. Unfortunately, life is not so straightforward, right? What we see instead is ebbs and flows and some uh, heights in our demand for testing based on maybe upcoming uh, events or uh, uh, holidays or football games or whatever it is. Um, and then there are going to be some times where 
demand is well below the capacity that we have in um, in the community. So uh, that is something certainly uh, that should also be factored in. Um, certainly, we can continue to increase demand, but there are going to be times throughout the year where the demand is going to be well below the um, access and supply, and it's going to be, um, frankly, um, somewhat inefficient and wasted. So that those are things that we're struggling with to better understand and figure out what that equilibrium looks like. But as soon as we try to understand something or we feel like we're almost there, oh, we have a new variant to deal with and a new set of circumstances, right? So again, it just complicates the matter. These are not excuses. These are just realities that all of us, I think, should uh, consider in the way we're going to handle uh, this pandemic at individual and population level. So if Emily, you're done, I'm going to hand the floor to Crystal for the next uh, couple of slides. Thank you, Nahad. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, so we'll move into some vaccine uh, information. As Nahad mentioned earlier, the FDA approved this week booster doses for 12 to 15 year olds with Pfizer um, boosts. And they also uh, slipped in that piece about waiting a five month span between the second dose and boost dose. Um, so moving from six months to five months for those Pfizer uh, folks. So we just continue to offer this throughout the community. Uh, as Nahat also mentioned, FDA approval is not the only piece in this uh, puzzle. So the um, Western States Scientific Safety Review uh, will meet today. And I anticipate that we'll actually be able to see these boosts for this age group in that time frame late this week or early next week. Next slide. Hey, Crystal, uh, did you want to say a couple of words about the J&J um, &J availability and the uh, consent form? You, is, or sure. You want to say sure. I, I think that there's been some some questions in the community as to why we might still be offering J&J &J as an option. And um, if anyone's been to our clinics, we do have uh, a one-on-one -on -one nurse council with folks who are interested in receiving the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, as, as we know, and as we continue to, to learn more about these vaccines, the mRNA vaccines Pfizer and Moderna has, has put out, um, have, have been more of the gold standard of what we look at for, for this vaccine. But there are still reasons for people in our community who might need to get the J&J. &J. Um, particularly folks who have allergies to components of the mRNA vaccine. So after that counsel with a nurse, um, if it's still appropriate to provide J&J &J to that patient, we'll absolutely do that. We don't want anyone walking away without a vaccine who came to get one. Thanks, Crystal. And the latest data we have is that uh, certainly a booster um, dose of J&J &J is highly effective as well. So that is some good news. It doesn't mean breakthroughs won't happen, but it also uh, might speak to the cellular immunity that I was speaking about earlier. So next slide, please. And then this is a, a look at our weekly vaccination volume within Deschutes County. So the green bar, I, I tried to make this look a little bit different this week. So the green bar is the total amount of vaccines that were delivered regardless of, of dose or manufacturer within our county. The blue piece is how many of those vaccines were administered by Deschutes County Health Services, whether it's our own team or teams that we might have contracted to go out and provide vaccine in the community. So we can still see that we're, we're providing a significant percentage of the vaccines delivered on a weekly basis here in Deschutes County. Next slide. And this is just a reminder about our community pop-up clinics. Uh, we reference the website, and I would encourage everyone to go check our website at Deschutes.org, the COVID-19 page, as it's going to have the most up-to-date information about dates and times for our clinics. I think uh, this is also an important time to talk about inclement weather and how it affects some of our pop-up clinics. So um, many of the people who are involved in 
uh, in running these clinics are volunteers from our public health reserve board. And we want to make sure that we keep our staff certainly, but our volunteers especially safe uh, in inclement weather. So um, as, as we're experiencing lots of it lately, I just would remind the public to check our website, make sure that the clinic that you're planning on attending is a go before you come down. And then also, you know, as Nahad uh, spoke to briefly, we've we've got some wait times. We've got some demand that, that's sometimes exceeding our capacity. Uh, and just like other, you know, institutions in the community, we're having our own challenges, making sure that we have enough people to do the work that we have. So I would just also encourage the community members to come prepared to wait a little bit. Uh, that might mean a coat and rain boots or snow boots and an umbrella. It might mean different things um, for different clinics, but just come prepared to wait a little bit uh, and we're gonna get to everybody uh, most of the doses that we're providing right now, about 90% of the doses are boost doses, which is great news, especially given where we are uh, in this Omicron outbreak. So next slide, uh, unless so, anyone has any questions. If I may just add to that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, be discouraged from writing to us or calling us and giving us specific information around their experience and how we can improve uh, some of our processes. That is always welcome. And the more specific you can be in your email uh, the, uh, or contact, the better for us. That way we can hone in on the issue. General comments, uh, certainly we take into account. Uh, however, I'm not so sure how we can translate uh, general comments into corrective actions. So that's just um, uh, a plea for, my, for our community members in terms of uh, informing us of how we can uh, improve our services. The other thing around what Crystal mentioned is really around expectations, and I'm just going to be pretty straightforward about this. You know, um, uh, when I went to um, the Ohio State game back in the uh, fall, early fall, I stood in line for an hour and a half to get into the game, and I missed the opening kickoff. And this is a game that's been played for more than a century, and you figure by now we have figured out how to get people uh, into the stadium uh, pretty efficiently. Right, uh, but but it didn't happen like that. Um, now, so that's the football, and we waited an hour and a half, and I don't remember anyone complaining. The excitement was there, and all that stuff. Here, we're talking about a pandemic. We're talking about new vaccines, new processes, new protocols, um, staff shortages, everything else that goes with it. So, what I want to communicate is that yes, we're going to be facing some constraints. Some of those constraints we can try to address and do better. And your communication with us is helpful. Some of them we can't. And we just have to manage our expectations. This is not like going and buying milk, right? This is a vaccine, a vaccine that will hopefully protect us. Uh, this is a test that will hopefully give you knowledge and empower you to make some decisions. There will be some wait time. There will be some lead time. And we just have to factor that into our new way of life. So with that, I we can maybe cover the next Nahad, yeah. were you referring to the Ohio State game in September or the Ohio State game a week ago in when September. you waited in line for an hour and a half? In, in September. Oh, you were at that game. Okay. You mean where the Ducks won? <laughs> <laughs> we had to have one good, we had to have a highlight of this, of the season, right? So that must have been yeah, it. Yeah, my memory is not serving me well. I think it's my age mission. I don't remember what happened, but yes. <laughs> well, it was the highlight of the duck season, so yes. Oh. Uh, and this last slide uh, is just a reminder for community members who have questions. Uh, there's several spaces that you can go uh, to shoots.org uh, if you want to provide uh, feedback, as, as Nahad mentioned, we're always looking for ways to improve the services that we provide. So um, calling the hotline or using that email address. I will say um, just an important shout out to some of our community partners who we've been operating clinics in their space for months now, uh, been Metro Parks and Rec, uh, and the library systems throughout Deschutes County have been really wonderful partners. And um, some of the constraints that we deal with are really around space, uh, around physical distancing, around you know those sorts of things. So we, 
I think we're at the point we would we would welcome suggestions of community members who might have space ideas for us as well. So thank you. Michael, we can shift you now. Thanks for your patience. Oh, absolutely. And um, thank you, everybody, for for the opportunity to, to speak with this particular group. Um, I really appreciate it. I, I think that it's super important that we get as much information in everybody's hands as possible. Um, and I just feel very welcomed. And I real also would like to say that this has uh, been a great opportunity to collaborate with some of the great folks that work at the county. And I have learned a ton from many of the people that are uh, that have been briefing today. And I think we're all better as a as a result of that. And I want to uh, start with just two quick comments. Um, first of all, um, from a personal perspective, um, yes, it's important to have those expectations that you might stay a little bit longer in line than than you would like to to get um, an additional dose. But you know, there, my wife went to the sisters' firehouse um, last week to get her additional dose, her boost, and like went in there, saw friendly people, was right out. So it's not an absolute that you're going to spend a lot of time there, but it's. Uh, it, it, a wise expectation that it might take a bit, but thank you for that. Um, so my presentation does have a slightly different uh, perspective just because of the context from which I work. Um, I'm part of the uh, St. Charles healthcare system. So I look at things from who is our, uh, our patient base, which is primarily a tri-county region. Um, although it does reach all the way into some of the other counties in region seven, but um, so some of the numbers that you're going to see here um, are from a tri-county perspective. Um, and secondly, um, because I do work for the hospital system, it's, it, I'm looking at things as they pertain to, um, you know, the, that our hospitals and our resources. So uh, some of my perspective is a little bit different. Um, and even some of the way that I define things is slightly different. I'll try and highlight that. Um, so here's the first example. I mean, in the in the tri-county area, you know, it's showing that we have this huge spike in the number of positive cases. And as of this morning, um, the seven-day count was over 2,000. So yes, it's still climbing. Um, and it's not just the Omicron uh, prevalence, um, but perhaps uh, some, some other uh, things that are happening in our community that are not helping the situation. Um, and they're listed there on the, on the side. The positivity rate um, was mentioned before, and I wanna just uh, maybe make one additional comment on that. Yes, there are outside uh, influences that make this uh, less than perfect metric to monitor, but it has been fairly consistent over time. So um, a lot of those at-home tests, uh, perhaps might've been people who would not have gotten tested before so maybe they aren't in the midst. So I, I don't know, I look at it over time as opposed to an absolute number. And over time, this positivity rate is very high compared to what it's been in the past. Um, so I just leave, leave it at that. And you can see the sources there um, uh, for, the, for these two uh, charts. So the next slide shows um, our predictive model. And when I build this model, it has, um, a long list of parameters um, and, and assumptions that go into it. And it, I just can't emphasize enough that early on when we're on the rise going into a surge, there's just some tremendous um, variability um, in like just how confident are we on the, the values of the parameters that are, that are in the model. Um, Nahad mentioned that in the very first slide of all the things that, that what we know well, these are things that we need to know and we have good estimates on as time goes on, but we refine those estimates and we, uh, and, and, and that does impact our, our future predict, predictions for hospitalizations. So if, and I, let me just show you the level of, of sensitivity that we're talking about. If we're off by 10 percentage points on how much this particular variant um, evades our immunity, like either from vaccination or from uh, national immunity or boosted or a hybrid of all of that. If we're off by just 10 percentage points, 
we could triple the number of susceptible people to this virus. And what that could do is um, like that curve to the right, you can add 50 beds to that, <laughs> you know? So there's just a, a lot of, um, I won't call it guesswork. It's it, we, we try and make informed decisions based on the data that are available. This is our best guess so far. And every day this week, I've been getting confirming information that I think that we have the parameters pretty darn close. Um, but it would it would actually surprise me if exactly what you see here is exactly what we experience. Um, so next slide, please. Um, there has been a lot of talk lately about how nice it is that the uh, mortality rate, uh, or excuse me, the, the number of mortalities um, has gone down. And you can see that for the for three months in a row, we've had a significant decrease in the number of people who are dying in the hospital system. Those are the only ones that are being represented here. And that's a great thing. But what I'd like to point out is a lot of that simply has to do with patient volume. And if you take a look at the mortality rate um, of, of hospitalized, hospitalized COVID patients, that still remains very high. So if you're in the hospital um, in the month of December, uh, you know, 12.5% of those patients died. That's, that, that's a sobering statistic. Um, and so I just don't want to, you know, everybody's talking about how the severity of Omicron is supposed to be less. Boy, wouldn't it be nice to see that mortality rate um, drop significantly? And I'm expecting it to. Um, but um, I, it's, it's more than just the number of people that die. Um, so let's, let's move on to the next slide. And I do apologize for how wordy this slide is, but there's a lot of information here. And, and as I speak to some of these bullets, I'll let you kind of read through this. There, there's a lot of treatments and these are reactive measures um, to somebody who is, has, has been exposed and, and, and positive and is aimed uh, primarily at, our, at, at the very um, most at-risk at uh, patients. So it, it's not something that uh, everybody can rely upon. It's scrutinized and because of the supply um, only gets administered to a small percentage of those um, who, who uh, have a positive result with the test. Um, we have received some of uh, the, the oral therapies, one from Merck and one from Pfizer, but to give you an idea of, of the, um, just how short supply this, the, these are coming to us, we got 20 um, of the Merck and 60 of the Pfizer. And when we have over 2,000 positive cases in the past seven days, that doesn't go very far. Um, so we have to, we have some very tough decisions on how do we get these things into the provider's hands to give to the best patients who would benefit the most from these. Um, so that's a, a very scrutinizing uh, process. Um, we are switching from the, um, the monoclonal antibody treatment that was effective against Delta. Now we have a new one for Omicron, but again, um, it's in short supply, um, but being used and being used effectively. Um, so also very recently, um, just in this, this week, we've got some long-term monoclonal um, antibody uh, therapies for some of our uh, cancer patients, and that's being used in the cancer center. So I just wanted to highlight that because that's, that's really good news. Um, so the final bullet there is kind of the, um, it, I think, quite important, and we do sound like a broken record, but, you know, these reactive measures to counteract when somebody becomes positive are very important and, and, and successful when they're used. But the best way to do this is to be proactive um, and, and get that additional dose and vaccinations. Um, and that'll keep you from getting, uh, you know, a severe enough um, infection to where you may be uh, needing some of these. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Cynthia Marie for all of those comments because I'm just not, uh, uh, she's our clinical expert when it comes to that. And she was very responsive when I asked her to try and explain this to me, but. Okay, the, um, and this is my last chart. Um, 
just to kind of uh, highlight the the current effectiveness of our vaccinations um, and here's where I really want to highlight uh, perhaps a different perspective of, of my information based on what you saw before. Typically, when people talk about a, quote, breakthrough case, they're saying, OK, somebody who's been vaccinated and I'm saying fully vaccinated now to include an additional dose or a booster, um, you, you know, you're it, it's not just being positive with the infection. I'm only counting a breakthrough case that is hospitalized. Because again, those are the ones that are impacting our um, our hospital resources, and you can see the chart on the left there. And I know the the writing is small, but you can it, it's quite obvious that the orange line down at the bottom for those um, uh, who have been fully vaccinated is just a fraction of those um, who are hospitalized who are unvaccinated. So it can still very very much keep you out of the hospital. And the chart on the right um, is important too because. I mean, Emily mentioned this, that the, the more of our population that is uh, vaccinated, the more we would expect a breakthrough case. Um, and so there's a way that you can calculate an observed vaccine effectiveness um, that takes into account um, that proportion of the population who have been vaccinated. And you can see that that is, that is uh, all the way through December um, quite effective. Now, I completely understand that all the rules have changed as we go forward into January with Omicron. However, um, it is still being shown that if you have that additional dose, if you've been boosted, um, you really um, improve your chances of, of staying out of the hospital um, and not having to fight those statistics like the mortality rate of our hospitalized patients. So um, that's, that's uh, that concludes all the information that I have. The next slide has some contact information, and I have received um, several emails in the past um, from this presentation, and I welcome those. So if there's uh, some additional questions that you have, please reach out. I think I'm pretty good about responding um, to all of them that I've uh, gotten so far. So with that, thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Uh, Dr. Johnson, um, I, I wanted to go back to your uh, your prediction model uh, slide, and um, I, I very much appreciate that, that there's a whole lot of very sensitive variables here, and, and um, you know, I, um, I I won't be holding you to this model, uh, but I my understanding is that Omicron arrived a little bit later here in Central Oregon than it has in other parts of the state. And I'm, I'm curious whether, uh, you know, so what, what people are saying is um, it's, it's less severe, but just the sheer, because of the sheer number of cases, we are still seeing substantial amounts of hospitalization. So is that what's happening in other parts of the state where Omicron arrived earlier? Is, is um, you know, a, a, maybe a smaller percentage of the people with Omicron going to the hospital, but the smaller percentage of such a large number is still adding up to a lot of hospitalizations. Yeah, um, Commissioner Chang, you, you bring up a, a couple of really good points and, and ask a very good question. You know, to be completely transparent with you, I am not absolutely certain of the prevalence of the Omicron variant um, at this point, especially in Central Oregon versus other parts of, or of Oregon. I've looked at the sequencing information just this morning. There was 11 specimens that were identified in region one. There was an additional nine that were uh, identified in, in region three, but those data are so old. They're a couple of weeks old. Mm. So everything is like, how fast has it spread everywhere else? How fast do we expect it to spread based on that information? And you are correct that it gets, in the past, the variants have gotten to central Oregon with about a three to five day lag from when it hit in the valley. Um, so that's kind of built into my model. I have some parameters that say, when was it 1% prevalent and how long is it gonna take until it becomes the, do the dominant variant? And that's kind of how all these other things are, are keyed. Um, and so what you see here is a slightly delayed um, peak from what uh, Peter Graven might have for the estate overall. Um, okay. but, but you're right. Um, I just keep a very close eye on, 
on what we think is this is due to Omicron or to be honest with you, this very, very slight dip that we've seen in the past couple of days could still be just leftover Delta and from the holiday season. It's the timing is just about right. I don't really think we've seen um, that we need to have that three to five day lag from those positive cases jumping up before we see those hospitalizations. And I just don't have good data on the sequencing at this point. Um, okay. So sorry for the long winded response, yeah, but, I, but we are seeing hospitalization. Um, uh, I, I, I guess one, one other way to uh, ask this question is, are we seeing hospitalization uh, rates rise in other parts of the state faster than we're seeing them rise here? Um, I don't want to misspeak. I can share a link for the HOSCAP data, but um, I, I believe so. I believe the others are starting to come up and we haven't started to come up to that degree quite yet. But I, I really think that this is the calm before the storm and we'll know a lot in the next week. Um, but I, I certainly expect to see the, the rest of the state come up. But uh, my meeting is not until tomorrow that I meet with all those other data scientists from around the state in OHA and I'll get an update then, so. Great, yeah, I would, I would love to to hear back Happy on to that later. Follow up Thank with you, you and I, I'll send you an email later this week when I get that info. Um, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, so I I have a little bit of data here. I don't know if that is what you're looking for, but as of December um, 20th, this is probably old data, um, as um, Dr. Johnson said, um, but it may be relevant to just extrapolate. Um, as of December 20th, um, to 21st, um, it was detected and it was at 22% according to the sequencing. So Ben was at a log of 5.52 um, as at December 27th and then um, December 28th we're at 5.57. So that translates to about 22% um, of um, Omicron, and then the rest of it was mostly Delta variant. Um, we had about 20% um, ish in Sun River and in Redmond uh, wastewater. We haven't um, detected any Omicron yet. So that is the data we have currently. Um, it's a little bit outdated, but maybe that would help um, extrapolate. So, yeah, I would just clarify that a tiny bit and make sure that everyone understands those are wastewater um, sequencing. So this is not um, sequencing like through patients or positive tests, but 22% of those wastewater sequences. And then the numbers that we saw that Rita mentioned, the log, you know, 5.52, that's a scale um, that we've been measuring wastewater and how much, you know, coronavirus we see in the wastewater. And it is one of the highest levels that we have seen throughout the pandemic. It, I think it's the highest numbers that we've seen as far as that scale and that measurement. But those numbers did come from December 20th, 21st-ish time period. So um, just a quick, some clarifications there. And, and, and so the, Commissioner the snapshot, Chang and so the snapshot the from, that, they from were. that December 20th was that 20% of it did seem like 20% of the of the COVID in wastewater was Omicron. Is that, did I catch that right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, two quick comments. Number one, that puts it kind of in line of my estimated timeline. I think I have it at, at like 25% this week, um, just on my initial guesses and the initial, or the current parameters that are in the model. So if that's the case, then we're not off by too much. Um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, bring up was I had a moment to go to the OHA site and uh, Commissioner Chang, you are correct. There are regions one, which is in the far Northwest, uh, region two, that is just below that, and region five, that is also on the West side, but down in the South, those three very populated regions um, are showing um, more of a significant rise in hospitalizations in the past week. Um, than, than we have here in Region 7. Uh, region 3 is kind of about the same as us. Um, they're, they're also on the west side, but um, not seeing the, 
the kind of increases that everybody else is over there. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, per the report from the state as of yesterday, it said Region 7 had 28% of their ICU beds available, and that um, Region 9 had 40%, but we were definitely at the better end of that. The fact that we have, what, 29 in the hospital today on the report, um, and I noticed you've got it projected to be at the highest point in, I think it's March 4th, um, you know, with the, what is our count of 1,300, which is really the highest it's ever been. Um, you have that projected, though, at 95. Um, is that because this is not as significant as the Delta variant? Is that why it's um, less? Yeah, um, that's, that's a good question. There's, it, It's like this balloon that you push in in several ways, and when you push in one way, it comes out the other. But that that high peak is based on several things. One, the the prevalence of the uh, of the Omicron variant, and when we see that happening, and I think that we're on track there. The transmissibility, as it relates to um, uh, you know all people, the severity, which is um, how many people end up in the hospital. But also part of that severity is a length of stay, and I've decreased that slightly for the Omicron variant. So that also impacts it. Um, and so, yeah, when you put all those things together, um, this is what the, the, the model is telling us. And it's been fairly well behaved in the past when we, when we adjust those parameters. Um, and, and, and it's been a long time since perhaps I've mentioned this aspect of our modeling, but I really only have like a lot of confidence in my estimates that go out about three weeks. And that peak that is around the 1st of March is well beyond that. So that's going to move a little bit. But when I look back at the uh, uh, accuracy of our models um, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've done pretty well if we stick to that shorter window. And I've been told from our administrators at the hospital that that gives them enough time to allocate resources um, for staffing and for beds and additional things. Um, so that's, again, I don't have much of a long-term perspective, but I know that that's necessary to put something out there. Um, does that help? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. It was just good to see that we were on the end with a greater percentage of available beds at this moment. Yeah, and, you know, I... It, you know, the day by day thing just fluctuates tremendously. Um, I, you know, there are days, there's been days this past week, you know, that we, you know, were in the red for hospital beds in the ICU. And then a couple of days later, we're not. So that does fluctuate tremendously day by day. When I smooth that out over time, um, we still here in region seven, when we're eight percent of the population we only have four percent of the icu beds occupy or the icu patients for COVID. so we're underrepresented there so we're doing pretty well um, for the very very extreme cases currently um, and that hasn't been the case just a couple of weeks ago so um, i think it's really important not to get hyper focused on what is it today but what what are the trends that we're seeing um, Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Are there any more questions? No questions. Thank you very much for the update. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nahad, and your entire team. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. If, if I could just uh, wrap it up quickly, uh, uh, thank the team here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, I think what's important to me and my team and Mike, I'm sure, um, to acknowledge is that behind those numbers are humans and human faces. There are parents there, there are daughters there, there are sons there, there are grandparents there, sisters, brothers. Yeah, these are not just numbers here. And a person who is admitted to the hospital has a ripple effect on its families and the overall community. And I think, um, um, although it's good for all of us to question uh, data and try to understand information better, it's really critical that we all stand united against this virus um, and against misinformation and conspiracy theories, uh, frankly. And I'm hoping, and my wish for all of us, uh, the commission, all of us here, is uh, that uh, we're giving 
uh, accurate information and messaging to our communities um, so that they're in, encouraged to make um, good decisions and um, undertake behaviors that protect them and their loved ones and neighbors uh, in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Nahad. And thank you to your team. Thank you. Bye. All right. Um, in two weeks. Okay, so is Kyle available? Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Kyle. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, of course. No worries. Um, for the record, Kyle Collins, Associate Planner. Hopefully this will be a relatively short item. Um, I am back here before you today for a second reading of the housekeeping amendments, just to provide a little bit more background here and refresh the, the commissioners. Um, we had a public hearing on these housekeeping amendments, which are just general amendments. They come up uh, more or less on an annual basis to correct minor errors that we find in the code and to incorporate changes made at a state level into our local uh, ordinances when needed. Um, during that December 15th public hearing, all three of the commissioners voted in favor of approving the proposed housekeeping amendments that were presented by staff and went forward with a first reading in name only of that ordinance. Uh, there was a second ordinance that was actually adopted by emergency and that became effective as of two days ago on the third. Uh, but this is for the second portion of those housekeeping amendments uh, that covers the, the broad majority of, of the remaining proposed changes. Um, with that, I can open it up to any questions that the commissioners might have. Are there any questions? Um, seeing no questions, do we have There's procedurally you need a motion for yes. a second reading by title only, and then you'll need a motion after that for adoption. Uh, okay. So is it did, is the is the motion for approval of second reading by title only, or is the motion to hear the, the motion reading? would be to move. Um, second reading by title only of ordinance 2021-013. Okay. Um, I move, um, I, I move uh, hearing of, or I, I move uh, second reading of uh, the, the proposed ordinance by title only, and that ordinance number is 2021-013. Is that? That's correct. And I, I will second it. <coughs> Any other discussion? Commissioner Chang? Yes. Commissioner Devon? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Okay, so now we need another one. Just read the, the title of the ordinance there. The okay, an ordinance amending Deschutes County Code Title 15, Buildings and Construction Title 17, Subdivisions Title 18, Zoning Ordinance Title 19, Ben Urban Area Zoning Ordinance, and Title 22, Procedures Ordinance to incorporate changes to state and federal law and provide clarification of existing regulations, procedures, and policies. Ordinance number 2021-013. This time I'll move adoption of ordinance number 2021-013. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Commissioner Devon? Yes. Commissioner Chang? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Um, Approving ordinance number 2021-013. So I need you, to read the whole name again? Yeah. No. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, of course. Uh, just as one final piece here, these amendments will become effective as of April 5th. Um, so in a couple months, the, the normal adoption timeline. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you for your um, flexibility this morning. Of course. No worries. We appreciate Have a great it. Okay. Looking at our agenda, we have um, other items. Uh, yes, commissioners, we have uh, a few items at least. 
Um, David Givens has a, has a topic. I don't know if you want to discuss it now. I have, uh, Whitney has something. Um, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. I will start just before you do that. I, during the meeting, we did receive an email from um, the League of Oregon Cities and Association of Oregon Counties uh, notifying us that we have been selected as one of the pilot projects in the legislation for uh, creating a joint office on homelessness. So there were a, a dozen or so applicants. I can't remember, maybe more than that, maybe up to 15 or so. So um, I'm just sharing that news with you. We received it, and the commissioners also received a, a copy of that email and the draft legislation. So we'll be looking at that quickly. They're asking for some comments by Friday. Of course, I haven't had a chance to review that, but just sharing that news with you. So uh, with that, I know that uh, David, Whitney, um, maybe Greg is just here in case there's questions about other topics. Well, good morning, Commissioners. Dave Givens, uh, County Internal Auditor. I've uh, been working with uh, Deschutes County Health Services on an audit of uh, case investigation and contact tracing um, and uh, have been uh, working through with our legal counsel on trying to get the data I need to uh, work on that audit. Um, it's one of those things where our staff and our and our department has been putting information into a state system and now we'd like to get some of that data out of the state system <laughs> and so uh, the state just you know arguably wants to make sure all their I's are dotted and T's are crossed and uh, so one of the things that uh, our county council has uh, has suggested is working through an agreement with the county as the county health authority uh, deeming me to have the their be their agent for this audit and to also make sure that I assert the fact that I will uh, protect uh, any confidential information that I receive which uh, you know is of course what they are interested in as well so um, again that's required by our code it's also required by my professional ethics and a number of different areas but uh, uh, this would be an agreement between us saying that this will happen and uh, help us maybe move this move uh, the uh, state to uh, providing us the information we've requested any questions just for clarity so is the local public health authority the board of commissioners basically writing a letter or signing something yes I authorized provided a, a, yep, okay. a letter for an agreement for signature from the board as the chair of the board um, and I will sign it also just, just to, mm -hmm. to reflect my adherence to that, uh, that, those statements. So. so then a set of data will have private health, personal health information or whatever the terminology, uh, but it'll all be anonymized in a report anyways by the audit. Yeah, the, the information I've requested, I don't deem to be personally identifiable information. Uh, they consider anything they haven't published to be protected, so they're they're skewing on the, on the more cautious side. Again, I'm working through information that our staff and our departments normally have access to. It's just them sharing it with me kind of raises the bar in their, their, in their mind. So they just want to make sure it's all covered. Right. I can tell you we've previously we've been working with the DOJ attorney on this, and we previously solicited a letter from Dr. George as the local public health administrator um, which we provided to DOJ and uh, we we're hoping that that would be sufficient we think statutorily it is but they pushed back and said well we need something more we need to know that this Mr. Gibbons is actually an agent of the local public health authority I think it's a bit much frankly but it's easier to just get this documentation from you folks than to really press that statutory issue with the DOJ uh, OHA really protects their Orpheus system and all of our data gets dumped into their Orpheus system and I think this is just part of that practice of, of protecting the integrity and the propriety of that system and so they want us to dot every I and cross every T imaginable and so that's what this hopefully final letter uh, in this process is um, as David's indicated to the OHA staff I've indicated to the DOJ attorney uh, we're not looking for identifiable information. Uh, we're looking for just raw data, and um, th that didn't seem to be sufficient for them, at least at this point. So that's, ergo, the reason for this request of a letter from you folks. If we want to proceed with an audit right now, then I 
I would support uh, signing this letter, but I, I do want to raise questions about the value of pursuing this audit at, at this moment. Um, yeah, as, as we have a sense, our, you know, our, our health services staff is pretty uh, maxed out in, uh, in COVID response right now. So the, the question is, if we're going to be pulling re, you know, human resources out of health services uh, to uh, be able to respond to an audit, uh, I'd like to know that it is, uh, you know, what value it's going to provide for us. Um, and the, the other thing that, that's, you know, kind of driving my, my questioning of this right now is, you know, my understanding is that OHA is, is going to be moving towards you know, a different approach uh, to COVID uh, moving forward in the next, you know, you know, and probably in the next few weeks, um, an approach that, you know, is uh, not sort of, you know, uh, alluded to this today, but uh, an approach that's more focused on preventing severe cases and hospitalization and, you know, is, is less of an effort to prevent transmission because, you know, uh, at this point, People who want to get vaccinated, people who want to wear masks, they're 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 doing it or they're not, and uh, Omicron is uh, just so transmissible. It's you know that the, the, our our capacity to really effectively prevent transmission is is pretty diminished. So if we're not, you know, if moving forward we're not going to be doing as much case events, or there's not going to be as much emphasis on case investigation and contact tracing. Um, is it really time sensitive for us to to do this audit right now? So, I, um, it, so you know, David, could you explain? Uh, oh, sure. Some of what your understanding is of what you know, what the goals and value of of doing this audit are, um, and what it could do for us right now to be um, you know to improve our our, our COVID response. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Chang, th th these these are these are great questions, and these are questions that the department asked while I was starting into this audit. You know, is this the right time? Do we, you know, how is this going to benefit of us? Do we have staffing that can support the audit? And again, I've been working with Nahad and before Part previous George George Conway um, to kind of iron out those and those expectations and what what the audit is and what it isn't. I mean, I think an audit provides value before, during, and after any kind of big situation and so I think um, we were coming off the November December surge when I kind of started this process and uh, again I, I wasn't aware of until just recently the OHA's new move potentially to centralize some of the call call taking and case investigation um, that does put a wrinkle into it but again I think what, what you still gain from an audit is a perspective as to and again this audit is is uh, kind of honed in on the looking at the management of how we handle labor for these these surges and and flows of a pandemic. So how do we how do we manage that? How do we look at when do we add staff? When do we pull back on staff? How do we manage that that case level, the cost? So I mean, again, we have some significant costs that go into this over time, but. Uh, how do we manage that? And what kinds of things should we be looking at in order to better attune ourselves to those making the right decisions at the right times? And so again, uh, been working with the department, I'd say a lot of the heavy lifting and time that they've spent with uh, me has already been done. Pretty much it's this data. I've done a survey of the, the documentation. I've, I've, I've talked to staff. I've worked through some of the numbers in the department. Uh, this last piece is probably the biggest piece, but it's looking at information on case activity down to the case investigator level and trying to figure out, well, how much work, how much productivity are they doing? Uh, how is that working? Uh, how is that aligned with costs and the case volumes? Again, I think it, it provides a tremendous amount of feedback to the department, which, which they have not, you know, Due to the strain, like you said, capacity and, and, and work, they haven't been able to do internally. So again, I'm working with the department to provide this extra resource, and I think it's still very valid. Um, I think they're going to have to figure out how they scale down. There's lots of 
temp labor that they are using to kind of address COVID. It can be used in those kinds of situations as well. So again, uh, you know, I, I, once I get kind of into something, I kind of want to finish it. And again, I, I realize they're changing maybe models, but uh, I think this will still be a great value to them. And uh, the department has been supportive of the timing and even even during COVID. So. Oh yeah, no, I I. I I, I wanted to talk with them a little bit about about this and you know they, they they said that they supported it and they said that they've been um you know uh, you know uh, engaging and and trying to provide you with all the information that you you, you requested uh, i'm just concerned about whether it this is an appropriate time to be asking you know putting those kinds of staff demands uh on you know what in, in in the world of wildfire you do an after action review when the fire is over um, not not in the middle of the fire. Uh, so, um, I mean, if if uh, uh, if you are saying that the vast majority of the work that you are demanding of them is already been done, um, I would feel a little bit uh, better about moving forward with this. But if not, I mean, if there's going to be uh, you know, substantial demands of staff time right in the middle of the Omicron surge, I. I I really have to question whether uh, this is an appropriate time to do this. And, I, and I'd say first and foremost, yes, I will. I'm very flexible in terms of timing with them and I've been very clear to them. We originally had a, a benchmark that we'd get down to the 350 case per week number, which seems low now, right? Uh, <laughs> um, and they, they said, well, we want to move forward. They had some, some timing of staff uh, absences and things like that. They, they thought that they could, uh, support the audit um, I still think that's the case and I think the the level of support I need from the department is 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 at the low level now um, they'll have to respond to the audit report they'll have to kind of help me with maybe if there's some specific findings some uh, some observations and maybe help with uh, of course you know tuning the recommendations and making sure that they're relevant um, but I think those are things well within you know, a modest amount of time. So again, I'm also very lenient with any department that needs additional time because of extra stresses. And uh, believe me, I will let them have as much time as they need because of COVID. So uh, I, I really want to make sure that they get the information that I've worked on, the data, the analysis, uh, into their hands so they can make changes as they go. Um, uh, that's probably the, the big benefit of doing things, you know, during something is to be able to modify and uh, be aware of some of these these uh, things that could improve operations. Um, and so that's, you know, I, I, when, I, when I as an auditor think about what can I provide benefits to the organization from being in the middle of a pandemic and trying to, this is what my colleagues are doing. They're, they're, they're doing these audits of things that are happening now so that they can provide input. Um, we know it's not a perfect world. We know things are, are changing rapidly, um, but there's always lessons learned. And if we can get some of those into the hands of the departments, they'll hopefully be better equipped to um, uh, meet the next need that comes up. Whether it's a surge or a new change in program, they'll be thinking maybe some of the tools that are or recommendations I've given them maybe help them along the way. So that's all I can do is hope and try to keep the impact to them as as little as possible yeah, so. no, I mean uh, I, I very much appreciate the the desire to help people uh, you know um, get insight and improve uh, it's it's just you know um, we are in the middle of responding to a crisis it's not right. it's not like ongoing pr processes at the DA's office it's like okay well it'd be you know <laughs> while you're doing your work it would be helpful to have some insights on your work it's I, I really do compare it much more to, you know, a wildfire and, and they do the after action review when the wildfire is over um, because people are busy responding to a crisis and throwing everything they've got at it while it's, while it's happening. So, um, okay, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm comfortable proceeding. Okay. Any other so questions? There's a proposed sure. letter. Uh, do you want us to take a look at it or? Yes, it's the letter here. Uh, I sent it to you guys. Yes. Oh, I have, yeah. This is another copy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yep. 
I read it. Yes, I saw it. And I'm comfortable in signing it. And, um, you know, they did have, you know, we were down to like 50 cases a day um, for, you know, a bit. And now, of course, things have really shot up again. So it seems like um, Mother Nature really has her own agenda here. And it's always good to, you know, to go in and look. And coming from your perspective, I think, is really could be enlightening for what we're doing. So I, I appreciate that you are tackling this in a most sensitive way. One question for the uh, data system of the state. Are you going to be requesting specific data, or are you going to have access to the system to you know, kind of I asked them to, you know, I could do it both ways. I asked them to provide me the data or provide staff the support to provide the data because that's how this all started. Our staff, uh, county staff at Health Services contacted OHA for support to pull data okay. for the audit, and that's when this kind of yes, question. Yes, where it was going to go, and they yeah. said the auditor, and they said, well, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Yeah, now I'm supportive, just learning about this. Uh, so I'll move uh, chair signature of uh, a letter for the county internal auditor as agent of Deschutes County for access to state public health information. Second. Any further discussion? Mr. DeBone? Yes. Mr. Chang? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So Great, is this the letter you. I actually sign? Uh, could be. Okay. okay. Yeah. If you want to do that. All right. I've got a blue pen. All right. There you go. Thanks, Commissioner. So uh, yeah, if the, if the email was sent yesterday, I was busy shoveling snow like all day. It was amazing yesterday. So and <laughs> heavy snow. My shoulders are sore. Here we go. Thank you. All right, thank you, commissioners. Um, for the record, Whitney Hale, Deputy County Administrator. Um, I have for the board's consideration a draft letter of support for Mountain Star Relief Nursery. This is a request that came in from their executive director last week, and it's specific to the Mountain Star's new satellite location in Lapine. Um, this is a letter to the Oregon Association of Relief Nurseries, and apparently there's a funding process where Mountain Star can certify the lapine site and begin to receive funding for their new certified satellite site in lapine beginning at the start of the fiscal year 23 state biennium so this is I'll, I'll pass out this draft which i emailed earlier this week but this is essentially a letter from the board indicating support for mountain star to receive that funding it also highlights the board's recent investments in child care across the deschutes county region $600,000 of which went to Mountain Star, which will support this site as well as their site in Redmond, as the board is, is well aware. So um, for your consideration, um, Mountain Star has requested that if the board moves forward and, and does want to provide this letter of support, that we provide it back to them by the end of this week. So I'll hand this out. Yeah, and Mountain Star has been working towards this for a while. Uh, Lapine's been mentioned over the years. So I mean, I'm supportive of, of you know trying to help them move forward on this specific uh, uh, location. Uh, they do have bend activities. They're in Redmond now, and uh, Southern Deschutes County would be a great place to complement their services. And they provide such an important service in our community. Uh, you know, this is, this is a proactive intervention that prevents a whole lot of trauma and stress uh, for families in our community, and uh, I'm very excited to see this project moving forward. Uh, I'm also really glad that we, uh, it, I thought that we, we didn't just mention the, the ARPA allocation, but we also mentioned other support that we provide to Mount Star. Yep, this draft also mentions the board continued support right. through the service partner um, funding that yeah, comes the, as a result the service of the lottery process. allocation. So some so strong support for Mountain Star through a variety of processes. I think I was actually at a meeting in Lapine pre-COVID regarding health child care in Lapine and how it was, and this was pre-COVID. So, you know, this seems very appropriate, timely, and thank goodness, um, you know, they're going to expand. 
so I, I move board approval of uh, this letter in support of Mountain Star becoming, you know, being recognized by the Oregon Association of Relief Nurseries. Is there a second? And I'll second it. Any further discussion? Commissioner Chang? Yes. Commissioner DeBone? Yes. And the chair votes yes. You Thank you. Thank we'll you. modify this and remove the watermark and place it upstairs for your signature. Thank mm. you so much. Okay. Whitney. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the other item that I, I, was, I, I wanted to raise was um, uh, potential investments in some of the homeless facilities uh, that have submitted ARPA requests to us uh, in the last few months um, and some in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I know we have our, our standard ARPA allocation discussion next week, and this can all wait until then if, if we uh, so choose. But um, just, uh, you know, uh, I, I think we're all very aware that the, the weather has been pretty severe last few weeks, and um, the, the time sensitivity of some of these projects, giving them a, you know, a, a, another week of a lead time, you know, to, to know that they have the resources to move forward with some of their projects, I, you know, I, I think would be very valuable. Um, so that the ones that I, uh, that I saw on the list in particular that I, um, that I wanted to discuss were uh, the St. Vincent's Place project in Bend, uh, the Shepherd's House Kitchen in Redmond, um, and I, I, uh, I, I, I did. I, I would like to uh, discuss the Sisters Cold Weather Shelter uh, a little bit more. Um, it, it, I, I, there was a. It was a two-part. That one was a two-part request, and and uh, uh, Greg and Dan had sort of had kind of. Uh, uh, if, if I understand correctly, you were sort of classifying it as a needs assessment and, and saying that a needs assessment was not necessarily eligible for ARPA funding. But um, you know, honestly, I think a lot of what they proposed was uh, more like a design process. I mean, and you know, a design process can be you know, really nuts and bolts, you know, like uh, you know, the... Um, you know, our geological survey of the site is this, the engineering says that, you know, we can deal with wastewater. But, you know, uh, for a facility like they're talking about, you know, the design is really about, a, a, a huge amount of the design process is about community compatibility. And that was what a lot of their scope of work was about, was trying to understand, you know, what, what, what fit, um, you, what, you know, what fit kind of community uh, preferences, uh, that the city's preferences, and, and, and things like, you know, how they would operate such a facility. So I saw it, my, you know, I saw their, their, their planning process more as a design proposal. And I, I guess if, if it was framed in that way, I, I, I wanted to ask whether we thought it might be, you know, that it, whether that might be eligible. Uh, sure. Uh, Greg Munn, County Finance. Uh, so the only, you know, we looked at this um, in depth and just to make sure that we were um, not missing anything. And the only feasibility type work that's eligible under ARPA is underneath the infrastructure component. So water, sewer, and broadband. There's no provision for feasibility work um, elsewhere. In addition to that, in conversations with the um, with the shelter folks is that um, this is preliminary to any sort of feasibility work. This would be um, preliminary planning, preliminary community consensus work. And um, so that was just another uh, <coughs> identification of the scope of the work. It wasn't even a feasibility. It was, you know, what are the, what's the, what are the community needs? How's the community feel about it? So are you saying that is actually not ARPA eligible? Is that the bottom line? That's right. It's not eligible. It is not eligible. Okay. And St. Vincent's, um, they're what? Are they asking for 130000 135000 35000 Okay. How coincidental that I would meet the gentleman Monday at the bank 
and um, who worked at Satera, and you know satara has been in some of our information about the homeless in Juniper, and we were having this discussion, and then he actually said he, he's part of this project, he's working on this project, and I said, oh my gosh, we should be helping you, and um, I gave him my card. So, you know, how appropriate that that would come up today. Um, you know, they're, they're really talking about doing a, a two-year program very similar in that respect to the Veterans Village, and I told him how we were told by Clackamas that really 15 is the max that you want to do just because of personalities. And um, anyway, so it was um, just you know one of those random chance meetings, but um, really happy to see that it's on our list um, with funding that. And if I know that they're asking for this funding from the community. In fact, I heard there was an ad today. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I would be happy with funding that today. They're, yeah, they're, they're very close. Right. You and put them very close to opening. I mean, the timeline that that project has been constructed, uh, you know, not to compare with the, you know, with the, with the Veterans Village, but it, 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 it was extremely fast. And, uh, you know, that the, the tiny shelters are, are up already. The community building is... Or, or the you know common building is is all is almost done. Um, they are they're going to be able to move people in, um, you know during, you know during this very severe winter um, that that we're experiencing, and and uh, so to be able to help them get to the finish line with, you know support for the fencing and security system that they uh, that they're going to need, which uh, you know we have all recognized that um, though that's a integral part of any kind of a you know hosted homeless facility is is, is having adequate security and 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 safety um I, you know i think it's a it's a, a great opportunity for us to to um, come in at, uh, again you know sort of like with the bethlehem Inn in redmond at, at the tail end of the project and you know add final dollars to to get them to the finish line um supportive also i mean uh yeah if we want to start that process or make that motion let's do it do we uh i mean their their proposal was it, it was two pieces that there was the you know the capital costs you know forty thousand and then they they made, did make a request of eighty five thousand dollars for um first year operating costs and uh, you know i i uh, i 110 percent support the capital cost i could see if we wanted to you know, discuss the the operating cost uh, component. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it would be reasonable to to do that. We are coming in at the very at the very end of this project, and and uh, you know, I I I do believe that they have made um, they've made plans for operations um, that uh, you know b before we were involved. So um, uh, you know. If if we didn't want to, you know, cover just, their whole first year operating costs, then you said forty thousand and then eighty five thousand for yeah. operations. So that's one hundred twenty five thousand. Under thirty five, or, or sorry, was it? I think their overall request was one hundred thirty five thousand. Yes. So, I but have the letter from. Yeah, what I wrote down was forty and eighty five, but. And that makes it one hundred. But you're right. That only adds up to one hundred twenty five. Um, My mental math is. But but Amazing. Greg, does that match what's in the in the letter? Forty and eighty five, or yeah, I don't have the letter in front of me. Dan, do you have the letter? I see you on the screen there. Sounds like our number just might have magically. I mean, one twenty five would be a great number to offer because just like you're saying, I mean, yeah. right. fully funding a first year of operation is is generous. We do have dollars that are available like this. The community we want to see strong partnerships, uh, and, but this will really empower that operation. Any kind of uh, dollars that can roll over to the next year and then fundraising and getting people through the system. Yes. I think it was there was ten thousand dollars for landscaping, so that's the additional. Oh, there. Ah, is. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. So more than more capital costs. Um, well, let's I did speak with um, um, with the owner of this proposal as well at length, and I personally was impressed with um, um, his plan working with Pacific Source and and other individuals for operating costs ongoing um, to cover those costs. Just as a add in there. Thank you, Dan. So do we have a motion then? Well, I was kind of concluding the 125 may be the right number, knowing that uh, the operational 
I bet there's a community support for fundraising, any other operational needs. Okay. So I'll make that motion. Okay. Uh, support uh, St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, at, is it Tiny Home Village? or I don't know th if there's St. a name Vincent's to it. St. Vincent's Place. St. Vincent's Place. Yes. Okay, there we go. Uh, in the amount of $125,000 supporting uh, capital needs plus operating costs. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any further discussion? Commissioner DeBallon? Yes. Commissioner Chang? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Um, okay. Well, if we're done. No, I just want to clarify. We're we're funding that in 125. The proposal was 135, but we're going with 125 is the approved motion, correct? Correct. correct. Okay. And if we're done talking about uh, the Sisters Cold Weather Shelter for now, then, um, uh, well, I guess the one other thing I would say about that is if they if they need ten thousand dollars to uh, plan their long term operations, I I I and it's not ARPA eligible. I hope that we can be creative and think about funding it in other ways, because. Um, well, uh, that, yeah, and that's certainly an option. The other the other point that I uh, had the conversation with the cold weather or the shelter folks yesterday was that there might be some coordination benefits through the new um, formation of the joint uh, homeless office. So um, I think they might be looking at that as well. Right. Okay. Um, so what about the uh, Shepherd's House, the kitchen in Redmond? You brought that up. Yeah, um, so uh, I, I, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but I guess they, they submitted a request in, in October. They did. Um, and um, I, I would have been very supportive at that time, and I'm still supportive now of, of um, helping to get that, that project uh, moving forward. Uh, they need, uh, they asked for $300,000 uh, towards you know, getting their their kitchen completely set up, um, which is, I, I um, yeah, that they uh, they they asked for three hundred thousand dollars sort of getting their kitchen set up. That 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 facility is already functioning as a day shelter right now uh, during you know these very cold months, um, and that particularly the very cold weeks we had you know the last few weeks, and. Uh, you know anything we can do to accelerate uh, getting that operation uh, or you know getting that facility to operational fully operational i think is um uh, a, a good investment um for um our homeless neighbors in the redmond area and um i was talking with dave notori oh a couple of weeks ago and he was explaining to me that they're actually in a capital campaign to double their facility in Bend and they do have a s facility right now for women and children it's only serving nine and they're hoping that they can expand that number to 20 so you know they they've been here they have a excellent track record their program is great and I believe I did meet the man that's supposed to run this kitchen at an event this last summer so you know it seems like it does um, it makes sense Shepherd's House is a is a really critical service provider uh, in this in this universe of uh, keeping people sheltered and fed and warm. So yeah, having a, uh, a an organization who is ready to go, uh, ready to implement, doing the job right now, uh, and with. Uh, the American Rescue Plan dollars, it's really a good fit and a great opportunity. So Shepherd's House had applied in the past, and it was uh, during the time we were talking about um, the Bethlehem investment in Redmond, too. So everybody just kind of backed off. So that's why it, this is coming around again. So um, well, I'm, told, I'm supporting. I told Dave to resubmit it a couple of months ago. We really yeah. hadn't talked about it. But I said, hey, send it back in because the track record of Shepherd's House is, you know, it's at the top. They do it. They do excellent work. So yeah, I'm supportive also. Okay. So do we have a motion? Uh, I move. Um, I move allocation approval of three hundred thousand dollars for Shepherd's House for their uh, kitchen in uh, at their new Redmond facility. And I'll second it. Any further discussion, Commissioner Chang? Yes. Commissioner Debone. Yes. And the chair votes yes. Right. Those were the uh, 
three that I really wanted to, to discuss today. So, uh, yeah, uh, Senior Center in Lapine has sent a letter. I don't know if we all got it or I got it recently, and they're just asking for operational dollars. They're just in a spot where, you know, they're providing meals and they're doing activities, but there's nothing really revenue generating like in the past. So there, and there may be other organizations like this too, uh, but this was a specific letter from Lapine Senior Center. Um, so I'm just mentioning it now. It'll come up again. I'm not prepared for an amount or anything today. Uh, but it is that concept of, you know, they're really, they're keeping their doors open, they're providing services, but the the uh, income and expenses are not matching up like they did previous to COVID. So, I mean, they can really kind of map it to that. Um, so I don't know if, uh, does that fit into like a, a category or have, so as I say, there's probably other organizations just like that and even private businesses just like that. So that's why I'm hesitant there to is a There is a Council on Aging proposal as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. curious whether there's whether there's any interface between the Senior Center and the Council on Aging on, on services or or uh, not. And as I say, so I asked them a little bit more about, okay, what, what, you know, what does the future look like? I guess that's where I was going. You know, I've, is this going to be a structural change in, in uh, you know, how, how are you going to keep the doors open long term? And they said, well, really, they, they are seeing it as a COVID uh, issue, uh, you know, just and they had bingo night and they had, you know, the 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 car uh, car show in the spring, which I think they did, but it's just a lot smaller. So a lot of things are just different right now. So they are looking for resources to kind of get through for another another so, cycle. So there yep. is one there is one item. There's a project request on here from the uh, Council on Aging and Redmond Senior Center. This sounds very similar to that. Yeah, and uh, I do recall that. Uh, proposal Maybe that's, on, that's on the list here. So that's group a couple of those together to for a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Can we do that? Could we do that next week? Yeah. Um, I know I was asked by the director for the Redmond Senior Center. She was saying, you know, with food inflation, it is so bad now. And I said, well, we knew that there were 21 different organizations that were getting donations because, you know, of our beef donation that we did. They said that they provided 21 different um, organizations in Deschutes County with that beef. Okay, so how do we help those people with their buying power? And she's, you know, they are working so hard and it's, it's really hard when you don't, it's just like going to Target versus going to your little family market. And the, the buying power of Target is one, one side of the occasion, occasion, you know, and you go, well, but the other side is um, helping these groups get together so that they can actually streamline and become more cost effective on what their, you know, food. Everything is going up so much. Well, and I'm at a point where, you know, I'm thinking, we, I do want to ask back, okay, what does it look like a couple of years from now? You know, how, if, if there's rescue funds or, you know, a carryover dollars to be able to get you through, uh, are, is there a path to get back on track or, or at least acknowledging that the future may be different than the past? So, you know, let's start thinking like that. So just as an opportunity I would for just say that um, and as far as the Lapine Senior Center as a nonprofit, they would also be eligible to apply through COIC for nonprofit small business um, recuperation of net profit loss due to COVID-19, which it sounds like that's what you're talking about, a loss of, of revenue and expenditures staying the same. So that process is open oh, uh, Friday. through this Friday. Yes, through this Friday, they can apply at COIC. We have had 170 small business and nonprofit um, applications so far. They're looking at the eligibility, but that sounds like a pretty perfect fit for them. If it was pretty clear cut, you just have to submit your tax returns and your 21 financial reports. And um, if, if we can demonstrate a, a loss due to COVID, they would, you know, be eligible for funding them. Yep. So it's kind of a standard scenario that everybody, and I kind of knew that. I was just bringing it up here. Yeah. Good. And commissioners, if per, uh, we, we're going to discuss ARPA potentially again next week, um, I think you all received a copy of uh, the email from Eric King with the City of Bend regarding the 1.5 million. We've discussed offline that 750 thousand had been allocated for um, a managed camp. They're They've, they've, they're rethinking the managed camp and using it for more transitional housing. Um, more details will come, and then they're just seeking clarification on the remaining balance. So perhaps we can schedule that in the near term just so the board can make a final decision on whether to approve that or not. Um, I, would, I would love to hear from the city of Bend, you know, that, that, that kind of thematic 
you know, like that that kind of change in approach or philosophy that that's helpful to understand. But I would I would also really like to understand which facilities they're talking about um, spending those one point five million dollars on for operating costs because I mean it. it it, it's it it still feels a little abstract right now. Mm -hmm. So um, and, you know, it, I, you can see how you can see how we're ready to sink our teeth into like you know a kitchen in Red you know at Shepherd's House in Redmond. We know exactly what that looks like, and um, if, if this is still kind of if we're not getting to specifics yet, it's hard to it's hard to feel that kind of same level of commitment. That's great. Do you mind if I invite? at least Eric King, and if you uh, to, to discuss that next week, I think he'll be prepared to, to, to discuss that next week. Yeah, on Wednesday, that would be perfect. Yeah, great, thank you. Any other items? No. Uh, no. We'll we'll look at um, uh, putting a packet together for you for next Wednesday, if we can get that on the agenda uh, right. today. So we'll we'll plan on that and follow up with these items we're taking notes on. So thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Greg. Thank you so much, Greg. Thanks for and Dan for your um, being surrounding all these numbers and you know the ARPA funding. It's been something we never would have imagined when you were hired, could we? <laughs> that we would be allocating $38 million from the government. So anyway, yes. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I did just want to follow up when, when, when Nick mentioned briefly that, uh, that we've been uh, selected to be part of the, uh, the Joint Homeless Office pilot. Um, that's really exciting. And there were, you know, if I read that list correctly, there was, there was 12 proposals, but there were, uh, you know, a total of 15, 15 out of our 36 counties in Oregon were interested in getting in on this, on this program. And if they uh, are going to do a lot less than, uh, you know, the original pilot kind of concept was just for five. So if, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if we were able to get into the mix on that, I, uh, you know, I think it's very exciting that, that, um, you know, we made the short list. And considering that Jason has been putting it together, I'm glad we made the short list too. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Jason. But, uh, yeah. 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 I know. Many, I think it would have been very to disappointing. Representative Crop. Uh, many thanks to Representative Crop, but it. Okay. All right. Is there any other business? A couple of things. Uh, so I guess the board meetings. I was um, yesterday afternoon. I, I did get in the mode. We had Public Safety Coordinating Council on uh, in the afternoon. So that was. Uh, you know, police, sheriff, uh, public safety, juvenile justice, the, you know, the whole big picture there. And it was uh, Measure 110 implementation at the state level. Good discussion. It went on for a full hour, basically. The courts over there. Um, uh, dollars are starting to flow. There's a, uh, you know, kind of a system in place. Um, and it's kind of the behavioral health uh, centers in each county around the state, which is the key to this operation. Um, yeah, so it was an update yesterday. It was, it was kind of a good roundtable discussion for everybody to hear about it. Are these behavioral health centers like existing facilities? Uh, well, so, uh, sorry, yeah. Renew, renew. Uh, burns, they call them, whatever. Behavioral uh, health network services or something like that. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I guess I wasn't prepared to get too deep into that. But uh, the concept that, you know, they are thinking 36 counties, uh, specific implementation of these uh, you know things they're calling burns as i say now i don't even have the whole acronym worked out but yeah we could learn more about it here at the board level as the you're saying that some was of the measure we learned about it yesterday would be available yeah. for these burns yeah i'll forward to the to the board uh the presentation yep this is that was yesterday which will provide more information and then we can schedule a follow-up meeting if you're interested we certainly i mean I, you know we hear regularly from our behavioral health division about the need for treatment beds and oh and treatment facilities in our in our community so I mean that if that's I uh, you know I know that the implementation of measure 110 is problematic but if there's a uh, whatever opportunities come out of it I hope we're, we're on top of them oh yeah well Janice Garceau was there she was part of the 
discussion yesterday. So yeah, just letting everybody know it was, and we can definitely get some good content on that at the board level if we if we're ready for it. Or it'll come around when when it happens. I'm sure. Also, uh, so the Deschutes County Historical Society. So I'm a um, uh, you know board member there just as a experience or whatever. I was invited years ago. So it's just something I attended yesterday. Deschutes County Historical Society uh, building. The Reed Building is a Deschutes County asset that we maintain and manage. Um, uh, you know, the message is it's, it's pretty positive. Uh, they've kept their doors open. When people come in, they come in in a small group wearing masks, enjoying the different uh, exhibits. So it's just a real positive, you know, simple cultural thing that's happening here that's been able to keep their doors open. Uh, a lot of good end of year giving uh, for the finances of the historical society itself. So that was kind of what we heard about yesterday. Also, the Ready Redmond Economic Development Board this morning uh, was able to attend that before this board meeting, and uh, there's a good active group of people there. A lot of projects out on the horizon uh, in the Redmond area, a lot of land use. They say the downtown area, there basically isn't any um, empty uh, storefronts anymore. So remember, if they've just gone through a cycle where a lot of the storefronts were, not a lot, a subset of them were just kind of unused, you know, black plastic on the one front windows of a few of them or whatever. And basically there's projects in everything right now in downtown Redmond core, uh, which is pretty exciting to hear. Um, and then I think it's really important too. Oh yeah. Well, yes. just it's the downtown area isn't that big. And when they have empty storefronts, it's, you know, considering the booming manufacturing that's outside, you know, mm -hmm. on the other side of 97, it's, it's really good to see the downtown, um, thriving again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's gone through that cycle, it's, you know, the bypass for years and getting the hotel opened again. And there was just those last few storefronts that were just unutilized, but it looks like they're all they all have plans for something these days, which is pretty interesting. Also, uh, um, the core three public safety training center, we had a meeting on Monday morning, I guess it was. <laughs> um, it, as I say, between shoveling snow and trying to get to these online meetings, it's been a busy few days. Uh, so that, yeah, the core three, uh, the kind of land use efforts for, uh, uh, consulting contract, getting some land use uh, figured out there, uh, putting the, the ideas in place. Uh, it'll come back to us as a board at some point, you know, making sure, uh, you know, we're going to be aligned with what's being talked about. So uh, I've attended that meeting Monday also. Uh, I, I just mentioned that uh, uh, I've been tracking pretty closely the, the regional effort around uh, pursuing SB 762 landscape fuels reduction funding and um, was really pleased to see that when, when the dust settled, the, the, the proposal uh, that stretches all the way from northern Klamath County into Jefferson County, um, we're requesting $6 million out of the, the 20 or 21 million that's available uh, statewide. Um, you know, if, if we can get, you know, if we got two thirds of that, or half of that, I think it'd be great. But, um, but you know, um, if they if they got six million, even better. Uh, and one of the things I thought was most exciting about that that proposal was it, it basically is um, all the request is all for private land treatments. Um, but the landscape uh, contains a huge amount of of federal land, and the federal land the key role that the federal land played. In the proposal is is that there is funded federal work, in part because of you know prior advocacy to to, to get federal funding focused in this area, um, but that the the federal dollars, you know it's it's something like seventeen twenty million dollars uh, uh, in the proposal is match, so that federal that massive federal investment, is going to help leverage, hopefully you know up to $6 million of state money uh, to invest in private land treatments here in, in, in Deschutes County and, you know, spilling into Jefferson and, and, uh, and Klamath counties as well. But uh, you know, I just think that it's a, it's a, it's a I, I think we have a very, uh, very good chance of, of securing a, a large chunk of that $6 million request. And it's, 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 a, it's a game changer. Um. 
I just would like to, at this moment, acknowledge and thank Les Hudson for serving as chair of our planning commission. He just gave notice, and for some reason, he's moving on the other side of the mountains. <laughs> but um, we do appreciate his service the last couple of years as chair of the commission. Um, it's a it's a big responsibility, and look forward to having a meeting, a joint meeting with them this year. I'm I'm not sure when it's going to go on our calendar, but I think it's um, always important to see, you know, to be able to communicate and be in the same room with them. So I um, and thank you, Les, for your service. It's been greatly appreciated. I did have my public health um, update yesterday. Um, I thank Nahad and the entire team for getting together and giving the presentation and you know what you know what we're dealing with and what we're seeing in our state in our nation and you know in our county with our with with what is happening with our covid so anyway i thank i thank them for all their diligence i got a couple thank yous too real quick Nick, kind of going down that path i was thinking about it so uh here for Deschutes County, our facilities group, I want a special thanks. Remember, we had a big snowstorm years ago, and the you know just the weight of the roofs was was the issue. But finishing the roof projects, like at the uh, Courtney Building and the courthouse itself, uh, the maintenance of the facilities, knowing that when these big weather events come, that we don't have buckets that we're walking around, uh, you know, managing drips because that's the way it was in the courthouse just just last year. Uh, but, and then also the road department, you know, right now, this is the time, you know, through the holidays, uh, there's been uh, shift work and keeping the roads clear. It's amazing, you know, just watching the, the commute from uh, from here to my house, you know, I'm going on state and local roads and unmaintained roads and everything, and uh, it's quite a project at this time. And this morning was an absolute royal mess. I know that it was more snow in Sisters than in Southern Deschutes County it was, the, I know. was the message I, this weekend. For me to get out of my driveway, it's a miracle. <laughs> I mean, I like, oh my gosh. Oh, that yes. was me this morning too. Yes, uh, well, but I yeah. wasn't shoveling, but I have shuffled before, so anyway. But just keeping the equipment ready, keeping the staff going, the schedules, because, uh, you know, as it's happening, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, and, you know, it's just seeing the plows rolling down the road is, is uh, you know, real valuable at this time. And also shout out to the uh, utility companies. You know, you think of the power, uh, you know, we always worry about the trees and the limbs on the power lines and the weight or whatever, but I haven't really heard of any power outages in the last few days. I don't want to jinx anything, but thank you for the utility workers also. Yes, for sure. You know, there's a lot of people out there and always thanking them for working. It's mm -hmm. truly, um, it's, not, it's not easy to get to work someday. So um, thank you for all that you do to and the workers especially. I know I went out to the road department with a box of candy before Christmas because I knew this would be like their busy time. And it, you know they're doing a fabulous job when you don't get those po phone calls or those uh, emails. And truly, we've gotten them in the past. And um, yeah, I haven't really gotten any complaining about, so it m must be good news, well, right? the potholes are still coming. After yeah, the, the potholes are coming. Event. Yes, I do see a lot of potholes. Yeah. Oh, well. Anyway, any other? M Nick. Well, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chair, I, I would just uh, follow up on your comments with uh, our former Chair, Les Hudson, that we have initiated the recruitment. So if anybody's watching, um, it's an at-large position, which means anybody, any resident in the county can apply to serve on the Deschutes County Planning Commission for the remainder of his term, which is about two and a half years. The applications are available on our website. On, if you're looking for the jobs, there's a volunteer section there. Um, and the applications are due on uh, January 28th. So we certainly invite people to apply and serve Deschutes County. Well, and then uh, real quick, so this is the Planning Commission representing the land outside of the cities, the development patterns, the code the, uh, the of, of development, uh, and it's also, it's at the guidance of the Community Development Director. Setting the agenda is done by the staff uh, or at the board level or ideas that percolate up, so ideas can come from there. Uh, but yeah, it's the kind of the long-term uh, land use development patterns of Deschutes County private land. And I just want to say a thank you to St. Charles for actually, um, hopefully they're working on those 5,000 procedures that have been put on the, on the back track. Um, someone in my family got the call and made the, what is it, seven hour commute in the worst weather ever for a, a, a major surgery. So. Thank you, and hopefully we'll be able to get down on those 5,000. You know, hopefully the chart going back up to 90, 95 won't happen. 
and will um, people will get their therapeutics um, and um, not have to go to the hospital. So let's hope our community knows what their th therapeutics are, vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, zinc, um, and stay healthy and also get exercise. So thank you, and thank you to Stephanie for all that she does. Thank you for making our job seem much smoother than it could be. And thank you for, thank you for being here. So, um, and with that, we'll adjourn.